Welcome everyone and assalamu alaikum and good morning, good evening, uh, depending on where you are, uh, both colleagues, friends and uh, participants and audience. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, this is our seventh annual uh, Paris Islamophobia Conference. Uh, we usually would be gathering right now in uh, France uh, to uh, undertake our uh, regular uh, conference on Islamophobia, uh, which we have been undertaking for uh, at least the past uh, six years, and this is the seventh year. Uh, just a little bit of a context of the history of the uh, background. Uh, when France began its uh, legislation on banning the hijab uh, or, or in the 2010 election period or 2010 period, uh, our colleagues, uh, in particular Horia and others who participated at the UC Berkeley annual conference uh, expressed and asked for uh, ways for uh, the academic community and uh, those who were engaged in civil society to express solidarity uh, and find ways to engage uh, in really uh, uh, documenting as well as putting some context to the developments in France. And uh, since that time, it uh, escalated uh, with the uh, niqab ban. And now uh, there's a whole host of new measures that are being uh, put in place uh, in a very unique development in essence, uh, as some would say that France have been serving as the laboratory uh, to experiment and to put forth uh, policies and legislation uh, to regulate, to discipline as uh, uh, Salman uh, often says disciplining Muslimness and to really create uh, demarcations relative to Muslims in civil society. Uh, using the whole notion of fighting terrorism and now it moved from fighting or uh, trying to uh, prevent terrorism and violence to regulating uh, Muslim political expression, Muslim religious uh, expression, and in essence, the engagement of Muslims in civil society as political actors with agencies. Uh, and in this sense, uh, it really represents a, a very drastic uh, uh, escalation in uh, how Muslims uh, in France are uh, being treated. And one could also say that there are similar uh, patterns uh, that uh, are being uh, put in place in Austria and uh, other uh, places across Europe. So this conference really comes at a, an appropriate right time for us to rethink and revisit uh, both France as uh, a, a place where Islamophobia is not exclusively seen as the domain of the right wing or even some would say extreme right wing, but actually it would be both right wing uh, center and uh, center left as well as the left, uh, which might not be the case in uh, other places uh, where it might be always seen as a function of the uh, right wing. Uh, the second part of this is also for us to engage in comparatives uh, as we begin to look at the uh, development of Islamophobia in the French context uh, that the research is to continue to look at where are the similarities and patterns that uh, we might actually document. Not that each uh, that they're identical, uh, but there are strands that we could draw out and take a look and see what are the similarities uh, with the eye toward uh, also examining the broader Islamophobic industry or Islamophobia industry network uh, that do tend to share uh, information, uh, tend to replicate strategies. Uh, and in some documented cases, uh, we do also see uh, and uh, documented with uh, in here tax returns, 
of sharing resources, financial resources. An example would be uh, here in the United States where Gareth Wilder in the Netherlands was receiving financial support and contribution uh, from the United States, as well as some uh, other Islamophobic uh, outfits in the UK uh, receiving such contribution. And then in the last election also in France, uh, the uh, record showed that uh, Marie Le Pen's party uh, was running actually out of uh, financial resources and uh, United Arab Emirates uh, actually provided a rescue financial package. So in here also, as we look at the different cases uh, to look at where these uh, relationships are being formed and uh, how to identify the strands, uh, both in terms of resources but also the ideas that are being shared uh, across uh, the various uh, regions. So that's, again, as part of uh, this engagement in France. Uh, lastly, I, I would say that uh, just like the, uh, the Islamophobic industry is constantly engaged in, de in demonization in different places, uh, that also individuals uh, and uh, research centers, academics, civil society organizations that are trying to mount a really a counter uh, to what is taking place. We do likewise need to coordinate uh, to make sure that our research uh, is uh, focusing on the right uh, areas of research. Uh, as much as possible, not to duplicate our efforts. Uh, so whatever possible is to actually uh, uh, to uh, actually push and uh, support the work that is being done, amplify the research that uh, colleagues are doing, again, whether in the UK or France or Australia or other places, and, and amplify it and give it the right grounding. And then for all of us collectively to see uh, where are the gaps uh, in research that needs to be identified. So these are gatherings, um, not to rarefy our setting, but actually just for us to uh, network uh, yeah. among all of our research institutions to make sure that we are covering uh, these gaps uh, that are uh, in there. So with this, I would like to welcome uh, all of you who are participating, welcome our uh, speakers and panelists who responded uh, positively to our invitation. And also, uh, I really forgot to express my sympathies and condolences to uh, anyone that have lost uh, a family or a friend or a relative to COVID-19 we're in the United States are facing a, um, a mounting uh, loss of close to 300,000 uh, with almost 200,000 uh, 200, cases per day. In California, we're in sheltering in place until January 4th in the uh, Northern California as well as Southern California with the intensive care units are running at a uh, close to uh, full capacity. In Southern California, there are close to 5% capacity left. <coughs> and so uh, I'd like to offer and express my condolences and uh, pray for the well being of everyone, uh, you, your family, and all your friends. So now I'm going to turn the uh, first panel uh, to our colleague, uh, uh, Sadiq Sheikh who is the director of the Global Justice Program at the Othering and Belonging Institute at UC Berkeley. Sadiq is a partner organization, a partner institute here at UC Berkeley. They've been doing great work uh, on Islamophobia, both doing a bibliography, uh, but also documented the rising Sharia legislation, anti-Sharia legislation in the United States. So Sadiq, uh, you could take it right now and uh, get us going with the first uh, panel. Uh, for some reason, Hatim, I, <clears throat> it seems I can, uh, I'm unable to uh, start my video, but can you hear me? I can hear you, but let me see if I could get, uh uh video setting maybe and get all of you uh, on yeah. <clears throat> let's 
see you just one second. Mm -hmm. Does it work right now for you? Uh, no. It says that because of the host has stopped it. I have not stopped it at my end. I don't know if somebody is controlling my side, <laughs> <laughs> which happened. Screen maximum shoot tonight. Should I set it up for? Well, why don't you uh, start okay. the introduction sure. and I will work on this to try to get sure. it going. In the meantime. Sure. Thank you so much, Hatim, uh, for for all your work uh, you do um, to create a space for global solidarity uh, to fight back against Islamophobia in both sides of the Atlantic and other places. Warm greetings and welcome to the seven uh, annual Paris conference, religious separatism, disciplining Muslimness. Uh, in the next couple of days, uh, the conference panelists will interrogate the history and contemporary oppressive and racist attitude of the French uh, state and, and other European state directed at the disciplining and surveillance of the Muslims, uh, of the French Muslims and Muslim citizens. As Hatim suggested, my name is Sadiq al Sheikh, and I will, um, I will, I will be uh, moderating this panel, uh, in which we have really excellent public intellectuals, including Ramon Cruz Pogel, Horia Boutelgia, uh, Francois uh, Vergas, and Francois Berget, who will take us through this interrogation. But before we start, I just want to uh, point out to some housekeeping items. Uh, each panelist will have about between 15 to 20 minutes, which uh, would include, uh, they can use any audio or video materials uh, the panelists wish to share uh, with others. Uh, after the speakers uh, concluded their remarks, we will have about 30 minutes for uh, Q&A, question and answer from audience, but also uh, among panelists themselves. So for the audience, uh, uh, please write down your questions. Uh, if you're gonna post it in the chat room, write it down and uh, write for whom the question will be addressed. Uh, as we go along, I will introduce briefly each panelist as they come along to the podium. So, uh, First, uh, and due to conflict of, uh, of time, uh, our first uh, panelist will be Ramon cruz -Fugel. Ramon is a Puerto Rican sociologist. He belongs to the Modernity Coloniality Group, and he's an associate professor of Chicano Latino Studies, Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, a, a great colleague and a friend. Ramon remarks title, Islamophobia and the rise of fascism in France, the implications and consequences for European Union. Ramon, over to you. I don't see Ramon, he's not joining us uh, right now, I've been texting okay. him. Okay, uh, then I will move to the next one, uh, if that's okay. Sure. Sure? Yes. Uh, may, I, may I have a question? Yes. Well, if, if it's possible, I would like to not to be the last one because I must switch from English to Arabic very soon on, on a Turkish uh, channel. And uh, if this is possible, if this does not disturb the panel, I would appreciate being the second or the third instead of the last one. Okay, Ramon started. So let's let's see if we could start and we could work through the... Sure, we will uh, put you at the third person. Is that okay? Uh, it's perfect with me. Okay. Okay, I'm here. 
Uh, Are... Sorry, you, you can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yes. I, I just want to, to be the second because I, 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 have, I have to, to go soon, <laughs> if it's possible, just after. Sure, sure, okay. you are next. Excuse-moi, François. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, please, I, before I turn it to uh, Ramon, please can you unmute yourself if you are not speaking and turn off your camera? Will be great. Uh, over to you, Ramon. Hi. Uh, my name is Ramon Grossvogel. I am very pleased uh, to be here joining with all of you. Um, uh, should I begin now or? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, basically, um, I, there is a lot to say about what's going on in France. Uh, we will have the whole weekend for that. In this panel, we have uh, several distinguished uh, intellectuals, activists who are very well informed about this. Uh, what I would like to focus is more on an angle that uh, <clears throat> that I, I said to myself, what can I contribute here, given the distinguished uh, intellectual we have in this panel? And I, I, what I'm going to focus is more on the first, the uh, context of the rise of fascism, not only in France, but in Europe and also on the consequences of uh, this turn towards neo-fascist kind of arrangements uh, for Europe and the world at large. Um, I would like to mention uh, several contexts. The first one, which is we can trace back similarities and differences with the rise of fascism in uh, back in the 1920s and 30s of last century. Um, one similarity, of course, is the financial crisis. There's always some kind of deep economic crisis that affects the system, the imperialist system in a profound way. And Part of what happened is that in the imperialist system, the white working classes uh, have some kind of a deal with the imperialist uh, structures of domination, especially with the uh, imperialist transnational corporations. Uh, in exchange of their complicity with the imperialist system of domination worldwide, uh, creating or dominating countries in the third world uh, through colonial and neo-colonial methods. Uh, the deal is that the working classes have to consent to those methods and to the uh, structure of imperialism in exchange they're receiving privilege, some privilege in that system privilege of income, that is they get higher salaries than most of the people um, in the rest of the world. They get uh, some kind of, uh, let's say, uh, welfare benefits from the state. They get also working conditions, uh, working conditions that are, uh, uh, they get important working conditions that are very uh, useful for uh, for the for them. That is, they are uh, uh, in a sense uh, receiving something out of their complicity. This is the main point. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, you have a situation where uh, most of the you know, the uh, part of the deal is also done through an ideological mechanism. And that ideological mechanism is of course, racism. Racism becomes a part of this deal. 
uh, they have to be also not only complicit, but actively involved in the superiority of the white race. That is, they have to uh, be calling for a superiority of the white of whites over the rest. And they are uh, in a sense cemented into the structure of the system through this ideological mechanism because it's the ideological mechanism that, are, that makes them feel like a superior people over the rest and justifying doing what they're doing um, and, uh, and justifying getting the privileges of working class. Um, so racism and especially white supremacy becomes an ideological mechanism that is central to the whole operation, to the whole thing. Now, uh, uh, there are some important uh, differences uh, between 1930s and today. One important difference is that in the 1930s, there was the existence of the Soviet Union. So uh, this, um, apart from all the critiques we have to that, that so to the Soviet Union, you know, we have a long list of critiques to what really happened there. I, I am one of those who questioned the, I, this idea that there was so-called so socialist country. I mean, I, I think there was more of a kind of state capitalist society uh, with all the problems. Anyway, I, I'm not going to go into that, but just in the imaginary of the workers of the 1930s, uh, there was this idea that there was some place there uh, that was a, you know, a kind of a paradise for working classes, okay? Many people believe that among the working classes. And so uh, there was some kind of, uh, among a portion of the working class, some kind of hope there uh, and some kind of uh, you know, alternative in, in, at least in the imaginary, even if it's, it was not exactly real, given what we know today, uh, in the imaginary, they thought there was something there uh, that was an alternative. Today, there's not such a thing, okay? Today, we're talking about a, a world where there's nothing out there, even in the imaginary, that you can say, okay, the alternative is over there, okay? Even if at the time, 1930 was a false alternative, et cetera, we can be critical of all of that, but at least in the work, in the, in the Western working class, in the white working classes of the West, they had that in their mind in the 30s. And I think that is an important difference. Today, there's nothing out there as an alternative. The left is bankrupt, completely bankrupt uh, in terms of, how the left has is, is complicit to many of the problems that we are criticizing here, Islamophobia, anti-black racism, all this stuff. Uh, the westernized left is, is highly complicit with this. And, and even though in the 30s, they were complicit to still having the Soviet Union there as an ideal, uh, created some kind of delinking in the minds of working classes from as a possible like, alternative, okay? Even with all the problems that we have to talk about. But today, there's nothing that the left can offer, you know, uh, as an alternative to the present. This is an important factor, I will say, very important factor in what we're seeing, because we're seeing, in a sense, a deep, profound crisis like in the 30s, but without the imaginary of a possible world or alternative world, uh, which makes the situation worse because now working class and white working classes in the West not only are racist, complicit on the imperialist system, but they are, there is no, uh, no alternative there that they could see from which they could, you know, and they see the left and the left is, is bankrupt. The left have nothing to offer, you know? So the, this, ex, this demagogic stream right discourses and speeches, nationalists, etc., become very seductive and powerful in a context like we are today, okay? Now, 
the working classes are losing, like in the 30s, a lot of their privilege because there is a, a, a fundamental, a, in a fundamental deep crisis in, in, you know, we are in a great depression, even though many people don't use this term, but we are in the beginnings of the great depression, like in the 1930s, you know, and, but there are some differences. One, another difference is that in, in the 30s, the West was uncontested except by the Soviet Union in terms of power in the world, okay? And, and in a sense, the West was still, despite all the problems and all the uh, contradictions they had inside the imperial system that ended up in a very bloody war, you know, as we know, uh, they were at the, in the peak of their domination of the world. And the fight was for uh, uh, the fight was for that for those uh, you know things to to you know for that domination to be uh, uh, to be in place and continue. But today, the West is in a crisis, uh, in a declining stage, not in an uprising stage, and because of the rise of China, because of the contradictions of the work capitalist system because of the uh, civilizational crisis uh, with, uh, with the question of the ecological disaster, etc. You know, so there are all these things happening that makes the West today going in decline. So in this decline, it accentuates questions of, uh, you know, identity, white identity, European identity, American first, you know, let's make white America first again. I mean, all these things become very seductive in the absence of alternatives and in the, in the context of a rapid decline of the privilege of the white, white working classes. And this kind of demagogical uh, rhetoric and racism becomes very, very useful. So. We have, a, in a sense, a continuity here because if in the 1930s, antisemitism was the central uh, speech of the extreme right uh, in, in terms of racism at the time, uh, today it has become Islamophobia in Europe. You know, so there is a lot of similarities and differences in this sense, okay? Uh, and because there are some continuities, but with some discontinuities that have to do with the things I have discussed. And when you have someone like Macron now moving into this uh, string right agenda, you know, and we know Macron is a cadre of financial capital, okay? A cadre of financial capital, such as Macron, is now taking the agenda of the string right. This is really a, 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 a sign of decadence because that means that at some point and somewhere, apart from the fact that he's competing with Marine Le Pen in the elections one year and a half from now, uh, and this is a lot of what I have to do, but there is some decision made at some point at that level of the, of the 1% of the 1% who made this kind of decisions that have decided that to save Europe, they have to move to the extreme right. That is to say the neoliberal, the neoliberal uh, Europe of today, to save this Europe of financial capital, okay? They have to move to extreme right to win over the extreme right who are anti-Europe. And so there is a decision made at some point there for this, centuries or right-wing figures to move to the extreme, extreme right to contest the rise of fascism in Europe by them becoming fascists themselves. And so I think this is what we're seeing now in Europe. And it has, this has a lot of consequences because it means that in places where right now you have sort of a left like in Portugal or like in Spain or like in other parts of Europe, sort of a, let's say, centrist uh, left with all the critiques and all the matization we can make, you know, uh, all the nuances we can make of it. Uh, they 
they are now at the defensive because there is a rising stream right in Spain, for example. There is a rising stream right in Portugal in different places of the, of the south of Europe that now feel empowered because now Macron is doing, and remember, France is such an important actor in the European Union today, that if someone like Macron takes this line, it has a lot of consequences for the rest of Europe because it's going to legitimize and it's going to, to offer a, a authority to all these stream right movements. Some of them already in power, others that are not in power yet, that are being now encouraged by this move by Macron, because now they're saying, uh, yeah, I'm finishing very soon, now they're saying that there is a, you know, here is Macron doing all this crazy stuff, Islamophobic stuff that is going to be, all this stuff I'm sure is going to be discussed and go in further detail uh, by the distinguished speakers we have today. But, um, but the point is that, you know, I know very well the situation in Spain, for example, and I can see there how now, you know, the extreme right box, BOX, that's the name of this stream right movement that is uprising and the PP, the popular party who, is, who has moved also to the extreme right. Uh, this was the centrist right wing party that now is in the extreme right in Spain. I mean, this is this move. So Macron, I'm, I'm seeing like a pattern of people like Macron in other parts of Europe moving to the extreme right. So this is what I see that there is a you know, some kind of decision making where they have decided that the only way they could, the financial capital and the 1% can save the Europe that exists today that is in their benefit is by becoming themselves fascists and winning elections from the extreme right who are anti-European, who are coming to destroy the European Union. And so this is where I see this, uh, this danger because now the extreme right in uh, Spain of the kind of, uh, Macron, who are for Europe, okay, and Vox is not like Marine Le Pen in France, it's more for Europe, you know, uh, neoliberal. Uh, they are uh, now saying that, look at Macron, now they're using Macron as an example of uh, the policy they've been pushing for in Spain against the left government in Spain today. And now this move by Macron is having broader consequences beyond France, all over the European community. Because remember, the two centers of uh, power in Europe are France and Germany. And now you see Merkel coming together with Macron and supporting some of these Islamophobic laws at the level of Europe. And it was Spain, if you remember, who changed the content of that law that they tried to pass like a month ago that Merkel and Macron pushed for, it was Spain who pushed for a transformation in the language and keep out all these, uh, the anti-terrorist laws they pass at the European level, who, who pushed for eliminating the language uh, of, uh, against most, you know, of Muslims, et cetera, Islamophobic language. It was interesting because then, then in, that, uh, in that move, in order to get consensus, they agree on eliminating the, the, the language because they needed everybody to, to agree. And because the government in, in Spain is left, is from the left, uh, they, 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 they had to consent with, with the, what they're proposing. So they eliminated the Islamophobic uh, language, but Merkel was joining with Macron in this law. So in, in Spain, the government of, of uh, the left government, that's the government was, attack by this, uh, using uh, Macron as example, using Merkel, using, you see, and, and I, what I see is this, that now we're seeing the consolidation of extreme right movement across Europe that is not going to be the same faces as in the past. It's going to be people that used to be from the right that are now are moving to the extreme right very fast because that's the only way they they can save Europe from not being uh, dismantled by the nationalist street, uh, by the old nationalist stream right. So uh, I, I will stop here to open, uh, you know, for the other speakers and for discussion later. So thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, uh, Ramon, for this uh, uh, comparative and uh, take on, on, on what happened in France that extended beyond the border of France in European context. Um, we, we will come out to some uh, back again if we have questions for Ramon at the end of, uh, of the fourth speakers. So our next speaker is uh, Huria Boutelgia. Horia is a French Algerian political activist and author and community organizer based in Paris, France. Horia is a decolonial activist and her activities focus on anti racism, anti imperialism, and Islamophobia. She is a co founder of the Party of the Indigenous of the Republic, uh, and she is the author of White, Jews, and Us Toward a Politics of Revolutionary Love. Uh, Horia's remark titled France. Secret Union Against Terrorism or Against Muslims. Over to you, Horia. Assalamu alaikum, everybody, brothers and sisters. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and thank you, uh, Hatem, for the, the organization of this, um, this conference. Uh, you remember last, last year it was in Paris. I hope next year it will be in Paris. So this year it's not. Sorry? Sorry? Please, if you are not speaking, Anas, can you uh, mute yourself, please? Uh, apologies, Horia. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. 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 But let me, uh, Anas, uh, and everybody else, can you please, if you are not speaking, mute yourself? Go ahead, Horia. Apologies. Okay. So, salam alaikum, uh, brothers and, and sisters. I wanted to thank uh, Hatem for this invitation uh, and for the organization of this uh, conference. Uh, last year, it was, uh, it was in, in Paris in last December, and I hope next year it will be in Paris, just before the, 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 presi the presidential elections. And I guess that uh, next year, it will be very important to organize such a conference in Paris. Uh, so uh, I'm going to read my, my talk because my English is not very good. And uh, this is an analysis um, I did uh, just after the, um, the terrorist attacks uh, in Paris when the, the professor, uh, a professor were, uh, were killed by a, a young uh, Muslim. Uh, I did this analysis because the situation at, at, at this time was very, very hard for the Muslims in, uh, in France. And I wanted to, to, to try to understand the role of the instrumentalization of uh, terrorism in France. So, uh, so the title uh, is A Sacred Union Against Terrorism or Against Muslims. So, uh, France, similarly to the United States of America, is in the midst of an organic crisis, to use Gramsci's term. With this, he, uh, he names a crisis so sweeping that it threatens the stability of capitalism and its institutions. Indeed, as ultra-liberalism was imposed upon all peoples, the multi-dimensional crisis that uh, exists has destructive consequences an ecological and health crisis that is devastating both economically and socially, as well as protest and hunger rises from the four corners of the, of the globe, including the most advanced capitalist countries whose working classes were protected. Until recently, you all know the emergence of movements like um, like the Les Gilets Jaunes, like Occupy Movement, like that Los Indignados in Spain. To this, we must add another factor that the established Western powers are competing with the new capitalist powers, even as they are in fatal decline, as Ramon said uh, previously. This is precisely what uh, heightens their aggressiveness and the danger they pose in international conflicts. In France, this organic crisis is combined with a crisis of meaning, 
so intense that it that it shows all the contradictions of the French myth. Whereas those who are not white has always known that liberté, égalité, fraternité is merely cosmetic, the white working classes are gradually becoming aware of the gap that separates myth from reality, particularly since the state violently repressed the protests of the social movement and the yellow vest. The shock is such that some people said, usually it's black people or Arabs who get it. Now whites are targeted. In this, we touch upon an important contradiction that Macronism must solve. How to hold on to power while methodically undertaking a questioning of the long-standing compromise between capital and labor, which benefits the former in a climate that exacerbates a social anger that first and foremost targets the government's liber liberal politics and the state's institutions. Macron's biggest fear is the erosion of the racial pact. The more the pressure applied by liberal forces and undoes the social pact, the more those in power count on the solidity of this pact to enable them to continue to tie the destiny of the white working class world to the bourgeois state. And when the racial pact weakens, as is evident in the, in the convergence, convergence, convergence of the republics of Les Indigènes de la République, the social movement and the, the yellow vest in their opposition of the police, as well as in the left's more accurate understanding of the Islamophobic phenomenon and of structural racism, power panics and has only one option, to reinforce the racial pact. This is one of the key functions of the notion of laïcité, which is a, a world whose contents vary depending on the ideological necessities of the colonial counter-revolution. In fact, the aim is to substitute the principle of justice, the principal demand of all social movements, with that of laïcité, which is far from innocent. Laïcité is one of the governing classes' greatest ideological deceptions and is aimed as redrawing objective solidarities between the beneficiaries of white supremacy and the state's main interest to undermine a social and political bloc that opposes its power. In the context, in this context, the nationwide homage to Samuel Paty, the teacher beheaded by a young racialized Muslim, take, take on the air of a national ceremony intended, intended to unify the French people around the figure of Macron. There is accordingly nothing innocent about this religious tribute to the murdered teacher. The secular nation, national unity orchestrated around this crime amounts to a reigning in of critical public contestation of the official interpretation of the crime. The official narrative attributes terrorist attacks to those labeled Islamist fanatics who supposedly dislike the French way of life and democracy and seek to impose Sharia law and is combined with a hunt for Muslims that materiali materialize, that is materialized in the, in the dissolution of the charitable organization Baraka City and the dissolution of the CCIF. In minutes, uh, in minutes of silence observed in all schools and in the singling out of children who refuse to observe them. You have to know that 400 children have been singled out and 150 complaints have been filled against children, accusing them of justifying terrorism. And, and uh, also in the muzzling of anti-racist and anti-imperialist organizations. 
Although comparisons have their limitations, historians of world, if, even if comparisons have their limitations, historians of World War II remind us that prior to the deportation of Jews and French collaborators by the Vichy regime, the first targets of the state perpetrated repression were Jewish humanitarian organizations, just like today in France, and the anti-racist movement that was denouncing anti-Semitism and mobilizing against it. This parallel is as eloquent as it is frightening. The main aim of the establishment becomes clear to foreclose the, the emergence of other interpretations of the tragic murder. Uh, it, it, the aim is to, to make it, um, uh, so the, the main aim of, of the establishment becomes clear to foreclose the emergence of other interpretations of the tragic murder. To use all means possible to prevent the meeting of the two angers, white anger and the anger of racialized populations and the possibility of their convergence. This must be separated and this must be, these two angers must be separated. These two components of working classes must be pitted against one another because if united, they would pose a threat to the governing classes. Cynical as this may seem, the terrorist threat functions as a tool to adjust opinion along the national Republican line so that the racist consensus is restored and class solidarity is undermined. The threat, the threat of terrorism guarantees that the white political forces of the left, guided by their immediate racial interests, will fall back on their historical and structural chauvinism. Calls for national unity, to which the political forces of the radical left hardly resist, play precisely this role. The, stigmatiza the stigmatizing accusation of Islamo-leftists, which is the same as Judeo-Bolshevik, that the media used to accuse the left the left engaged in the struggle against Islamophobia, aims to pressure this left to renounce this project of unifying the two angles by charging it with a phantasmagorical complicity with terrorism. This accusation seeks to pressure the left into once and for all abandoning its solidarity with Muslims and the racialized population of the banlieue or we can say the suburbs. This is the analysis that should serve as a lens to understand the bill on separatism at a time when material reality is und undeniable, the wealthy classes, those who possess, are separatists in their refusal, the refusal to share. They live in the ghettos for the wealthy as the French government prepares to, to vote on a law to, criminal, to criminalize the separatism imputed to Muslims, a social group that is exploited and discriminated against, one which the Republic's racism has separated and continues to separate from white society. This is, to conclude, this is the hypocrisy of French universalism. This is the Lumière obscurantism. And I just want to, to say that uh, just before the, this conference, uh, uh, there was today in Paris a big demonstration against separatism. It means against the bill that is going to be, uh, to be voted uh, in the few days. And there, we were uh, around 10,000 people in the streets. But uh, the components of the, of the, the social co composition of the demonstration, uh, um, uh, there was mainly white people. Why? Because now today it's very difficult for Muslims to, to demonstrate in the street because they are very frightened by the political situation. And uh, even if they are, um, 
even if the, situ the, the situation is very, is very frightening in France, we were able to today to make a, a big demonstration about 10,000 people, which is, which is good, actually. Thank you. Thank you so much, Horia, for uh, uh, this overview. Uh, and, and we will get back to you if there is any question at the end of the panel. Um, our next speaker is uh, Fra Francois Bagard. He is a political scientist and Arabist. He is an Emirates Senior uh, Research Fellow at the French National Center for Scientific Research. From 2013 to 2017, Francois has been the principal investigator of the European Research Council research program on when authoritarianism fell in the Arab world. Francois remarks title from extreme right Islamophobia to Islamophobia of the state, how and why. Francois, please take it from here. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you to all the uh, panelists, including uh, my uh, challenger, uh, Horia Butelja, who said most of what I expected to say um, before me. No, I, my, my ambition is modest. I want to wrap up the structure of what has happened in France during the last two months, uh, during, since October, let's say, since the 2nd of October, and uh, put it into context and, and see where does this is, is going to, uh, to take us. It has been mentioned, it all starts with Macron realizing that he will not be re-elected in May 2022 by the same voters he has more or less disgusted by his um, uh, two liberal policies during the first uh, three years of his term. So he realizes that he has to connect with the, the right and moreover the extreme right. And um, this of course does not explain why is it that there is such a reservoir of voices on the extreme right and not on the left. Hmm? Um, so he will, you know, very cynically on the 2nd of October, he will, uh, he will uh, give this discourse where what does he do? Um, until now, uh, this very well-known discourse of Islamophobia, it was well-known. I, I, I think it's seven years in a row since you have this lecture on this issue. Um, this discourse of Islamophobia was more or less restricted to the extreme right, to parts of the right, um, miserably also to some of the left, we have a branch of the left, which is very close to this type of discourse, but it was not the discourse of the state. On the 2nd of October, it will become the discourse of the state. In fact, it is not so simple. In this 2nd of October discourse, which is labeled by the name of the city where it was given, Les Mureaux, Macron uh, kept, uh, sticked to his ambivalence, you know, that we, Macron is the guy who says, I'm from the left and from the right in the same time. In this discourse of the 2nd of October, he, he handed the both sides of the story because even if he said it very briefly, Macron said this separatism, uh, if we consider it closely, we are more or less responsible for it. Um, he also said, we have concentrated social and educational difficulties in the same uh, suburbs. He also said uh, some of our citizens have been deceived by the response of our republic. Okay, so this was good. But the other side of the discourse uh, took over and the other side of the discourse was uh, methodologically speaking, Macron said, there is a crisis. It is not our crisis. This is not a crisis in France. This is not a crisis in the Christian church. It is not a crisis of capitalism. It is a crisis of Islam. So he has brought up this uh, analytical dimension that there is a crisis in Islam. It's not only in France. It's all over the world. And what's the meaning of, of such a rhetoric? It means don't you look for any responsibility on our side. The responsibility is on the other. And the 
other happens to be the Muslim. So therefore, uh, the, the, the structure of the discourse was very briefly, we might have some responsibility, but I don't think so. In fact, the responsibility is on the other, which, who is in crisis all over the world. So what is the result of this discourse? This, these accusations, which were the specificity of the Islamophobic discourse, which were limited to a fringe, a component of the Muslim society, of the French Muslims, let's say as, a, as an image, those who had the very long bird. No, it's finished now. Now the accusation will involve, I will say 95% of the believers. And I, I, this pushed me to use a sentence I had expressed long ago. The unique uh, Muslim who is considered as compatible with the French Republic is the Muslim who is no longer a Muslim. So in the discourse, this discourse will be aggravated, will be exacerbated by a second discourse, which will uh, occur due to the assassination of Samuel Paty. So whatever nuance were um, comprised in the discourse of the 2nd of October was disappeared totally in the weeks coming due to or using the pretext of the assassination of this uh, uh, historic uh, history uh, teacher and then the assault on the cathedral uh, in Nice. So what will happen in the, during the funeral of uh, Samuel Paty, Macron will more or less radicalize himself. Um, he, he should have said, don't you ever ask me since I am the head of state of France to prohibit this type of caricature because I live in a country where from it's an, it's an, a tradition that we are allowed to insult everyone. By the way, allow me a, 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 a tiny parenthese. Um, when it comes to this sacralization of the right to caricature, um, which is the, the, the symbol of Charlie Hebdo. No one knows or so few people remember that before Charlie Hebdo, there was another newspaper. Its name was Arakiri. Arakiri in 1970 made a vicious, ah, a vicious, a joke, a lousy joke on General de Gaulle. It was not the prophet, it was not Jesus Christ, it was General de Gaulle. Due to his lousy joke on General de Gaulle, he was suspended. So where was this no limit right of uh, caricature, uh, which uh, is uh, reputedly uh, the specificity of the French liberty of expression has limits when it hits our uh, divinity, okay? But anyway, um, Macron, instead of saying, I live in a country where we have a tradition of, so don't ask me to try it. it. I'm, I'm not a supporter, but I will not. He said, we will keep, we will keep publishing such, publishing such caricature. And this was very awkward. And of course, this was very badly received by uh, the Arab and Muslim environment. And this started this very limited uh, reaction, economic reactions this very limited popular reaction. I have, um, I have uh, created, suggested a, a, a new concept to, to um, evaluate uh, the, the strength of such a boycott. I, I, I think that there is the Vashkiri boycott. I hope you uh, people know what Vashkiri is. It's one of the most famous uh, French cheese realization, industrial cheese. But Vashkiri is only 2% of our exports. At a time when, by the regimes, there was no serious reaction because the regimes, more or less, I will not have time to address this issue, but more or less the regimes support this Islamophobic discourse, which they use themselves to discredit their, um, uh, their opponents. So the result was that not only the jihadis, like it was in the past, not only the Salafis, like it was already more or less, but also Muslim Brotherhood, but not only Muslim Brotherhood. Outside, 
uh, NGOs who, which were acting away from the political arena, like it was mentioned by uh, Horia, Baraka City, and this NGO struggling against Islamophobian uh, aggressions against uh, Muslims were dissolved. And uh, this, I think, is the borderline. This is the red line which allows us to say very calmly that dissolving CCIF uh, was the, the red line beyond which France has moved out of the state of law. Uh, and, I, and this is not an exaggeration. This is not, um, OK? The, um, the criteria, and I will conclude, are of two types. Of course, if you wear or support the hijab, but if you only um, promote halal food, but if you have an Islamic library, I have written this afternoon the preface for a book of this poor guy who was uh, heading a library which is targeted as, as a ter terrorist uh, conveyor belt hmm? at a time where it is absolutely stupid because inside the library you can find 1,000 different titles of 1,000 different brand of Islamic thinking. Uh, but they concentrate on one which is supposedly, uh, besides the fact that it has been demonstrated by inquiries, by interviews in the jails, that the, 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 what people read has nothing to do well with their will of, of, of uh, moving uh, toward violence. But there's another criteria. My name is Francois. I happen not to be a Muslim. If I write down that I am not supporting the Charlie newspaper until now, I don't know, maybe next year, but until now I am not criminalized as such. But CCIF has been criminalized. If, you, if your first name is Mohammed, if you say what Francois says, you will be from now on criminalized. It will be considered as, uh, as an indicator that you are on the conveyor belt which ends to uh, terrorism. As a conclusion, I will just give an example of the stupidity of what is uh, the French government in do is doing. Now, let's say that the French government is not struggling against terrorism. It doesn't give a damn. He is instrumentalizing the fear of terrorism to make electoral profit. But anyway, dissolving the CCIF can be compared with can you imagine in the early 80s, we had an extreme left terror. Did we lose Francois? Yeah, we, can't, we lost Francois. I can't hear him. I can't hear him either. We just. Hmm. Well, do you want to go to the next speaker and see if he comes back? Sure, sure. We expect these uh, dropping you know, from different parts. Okay. If uh, he comes um, back, then we'll put him in. We'll give him some time, sure. Okay, our uh, apologies for this uh, technical glitches with Francois, but uh, we have to move for our next speaker, uh, which she was waiting patiently, and we appreciate that. I would like to welcome uh, Francoise Verges, I hope I pronounce your name right, uh, who's an activist and public educator, member of the collective Decolonizing the Art Works with People who are Artists of Color. She writes on slavery and colonialism as foundations of modernity and decolonial feminism. Francoise uh, remarked titled Rewriting French Colonial History in the Present. 
Over to you, Francois. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone and to all the preceding, you know, eminent uh, speaker before me. So yes, I mean, uh, Professor uh, Bazan was talking about France as a laboratory. I would like to speak, uh, I mean, to make some, some point about, uh, you know, the, this question of the colonial past and Islamophobia and insist on the role of the left, of the institutional left, of the socialist party, especially, uh, you know, as a, and was chosen really from the 1980s to really roll, roll back on a lot of laws and social law to institute neoliberalism. And we started to have the remark, Islamophobic remark already by the 1980s. And um, so, and through that, I mean, a certain uh, repetition about, uh, you know, what is a national identity, what is to be French, and, uh, and uh, constantly being repeated a certain mise en scène to maintain uh, this identity as something exceptional, right? I mean, something really uh, absolutely unlike any other <coughs> national identity. Sorry? And uh, so the current law that are targeting Muslim and that are also reducing liberties uh, come after years of reducing or rolling back dissent. This does not start with Macron and the authoritarian regime is being, you know, prepared for a wall. All the systematic and structural violence, we have seen it before. So what is really new? What is different? I mean, we, we can see from, you know, uh, uh, François Mitterrand on, and especially since Sarkozy, Hollande, and Macron, a series of the obsession about, around national identity on the question of, you know, excluding some people from citizenship was already there. But the context today is also, on the one hand, the pandemic with more poverty, uh, more precarity, more deaths we know among poor and racialized uh, population in France and in, uh, in so-called overseas territory, more precarity, more vulnerability, following that have led to protest. And these protests have been very severely repressed as Uria was reminding us for the yellow jacket. So the state want to keep the monopoly and uh, you know, the militarization of the police, of violence, a younger generation also of the right-wing people, you know, I mean, we talk about Marine Le Pen, but there is a younger generation and that is using also the social network that is trying to be different. So, but we have been living with Islamophobia for the last 30 years, you know, it's like three decades of Islamophobia in a society that is really saturated, literally saturated every day. By Islamophobia, through which a certain, you know, uh, French identity is being constantly replayed, especially around the veil, you know, like a, constantly a controversy and has to be changed. Or the Burkini, every summer there is some controversy about some, you know, totally uh, fantasized Burkini. Or the story of Café Forbidden to Women that are effectively, you know, owned by Muslims. Or the question of polygamy. Or the fact that violence will be, you know, by nature, I mean, men, Muslim men will be more violent by nature or the question of radicalization. So Islam is really haunting Europe and haunting France. But I want just to make a little, ba a little more uh, going back. I, I do see, for instance, after the independence of Algeria, a huge movement of, you know, uh, the, whose objective was denigrating anti-colonialism and denigrating anti-imperialism. And a whole generation of so-called intellectuals that we still see today, you know, in the media, Elisabeth Badinter, Pascal Bruckner, Bernard-Henri Lévy and others, arriving and publishing a lot of books which were really against national independence movement, against anti-imperialist movement, against political anti-racism, against any kind of feminism which was not white and bourgeois. It was a way of saying that, you know, anti-colonial struggle had failed. I, and even though, you know, after 1962, we know that repression continued in the so-called overseas territory. So the importance of holding on the colonial narrative, because that was the question that was put forward, for me is really the civilizing mission that remained. There is a long history we know of whitening Europe and whitening France. And we, I mean, Raman remember, you know, about the Jews, but even how it's being replaced with the Reconquistas, with the Arab and the Muslim and the Roma. It's a constant, you know, really replayed. So that for me, it's really, really has been a long history, a long history 
of also denigrating. And through that, you know, Muslim representing also, and we should not, we also not forgotten, forget Palestine, the role of Palestine in all this Islamophobia and obsession. That is also to crush any kind of anti imperialist movement. So it's nothing new on the one hand, but at the same time, it is new. And again, I say the civilizing mission and the role, the, the figure of the veil woman, the role that this woman play in France is extremely important. There is a constant replay of, you know, almost like the birth of a nation in the United States. The story in the France would be the veil woman. And again, so that we provide an incredible everyday article, declaration, manifesto that women's rights are being threatened by the veil woman. So what is being replayed through that is also the idea of France as the land of equality between women and men, which is by nature open you know, to the equality, whereas Muslim are by nature hostile to that equality. So we are back to the France final you know, remark, get the woman and the rest will follow. That is you know, how we identify a, a French colonial uh, policy towards a uh, non-Christian, uh, non-white woman. Or, you know, Gayatri Spivak saving brown women from brown men. And this is being really replayed. So the trope of white savior is also very powerful in that Islamophobic uh, narrative. It's not just effectively attacking, it's also saving some uh, women from that. And so, um, and, and so there is still a very powerful trope and, and which is being played out, you know, everything that attacks something of the ID. I mean, I don't know, we, this is not related to Islamophobia, but when young black Martinican uh, put down the statue of Victor Schoelcher with an I iconic uh, Republican figure, it was absolutely scandal among the left and the right and even some Martinican intellectual. So everything that attack that question, a certain narrative in which France is always, you know, in this world of white savior is being taken by France as very, as very problematic. And so um, there was a lot of history, as I say, um, and uh, in the self also in a silence about this colonial history. But there is a, a reactivation of, you know, writing and challenging this history through, you know, blog today, incredible, you know, creativity by young people in France. Uh, talking about, in fact, uh, podcast, film, documentary, book, and article, and questioning also the multiculturalism, the kind of multiculturalism that the state will want to put forward. In a way, because there is a form of multiculturalism that Macron wants to put forward, and that, in fact, is play that goes along with Islamophobia. It's not contradictory with Islamophobia. This is a good, there is a good Muslim and the bad Muslim and the good Muslim can enter this multicultural world. So again, I, I want to say that it, it's not really monolithic. And um, sorry, I don't need to. Sorry, I needed some water. What is going, what, but the, at the same time, the institution are not being really transformed. And we know the university, school, I mean, we have in the textbook, the way for instance, Islam is presented or the Arab or the Muslim history is being presented in the textbook today in, at school is very Islamophobic. But there are constantly also the dissemination of that through TV series, through everyday talk about the veil woman. That's also the way because we have the big event like the Samuel Patty murder, but we do have this relentless everyday almost education in Islamophobia that is, uh, that is there. So um, we have also to, to remind ourselves, as I say, you know, that uh, the colonialism, French colonialism is not dead. I know that there is that idea. But as I say, it's still there. It's still there in the so-called uh, overseas territory. It is there in the relation of France with you know, the rest of the world and with Africa. So I want to insist, I want to go back to this uh, France final remark, get the woman and the rest will follow. The role of a white feminist and white bourgeois feminist in France in Islamophobia, as I, you know, written, 
they were the one, and even someone like Gisela Dimi was, you know, a very play an important role in that in you know in meeting in 1999, in which they denounce and they say that Islam was the most important enemy of women's rights and that a Muslim patriarchy was the worst patriarchy of the entire planet. So there was already, you know, all the trope being in place, and and in, and again, you know, so the lost children of this family, the fact that the state could if invade, enter the intimacy of the family, the fact that the state could arrest three children of 10, 10 year old uh, children of Muslim family and question them for hours has been made possible by all this preparation for the three last decades of, you know, con uh, allowing the state to intervene, directly intervene in people's life in the Muslim family, in people, and talking endlessly about their sexuality, about the way they feed themselves, the way they educate their family, the way they educate their children. Everything, a constant pathologization. There is a pathology, a presentation of the Muslim community as pathological that has served also for this law to be able today. I mean, we saw by the 1980s, from the left to the right, there was a common they, come, they were sharing the same opinion that the veiled woman, that Muslim, as they say, Muslim custom or Muslim culture was detrimental and was threatening really Republican value. And this obsession with Republican value today because the law against separatism has been renamed, the law to reinforce Republican value, which is of course totally empty as a title, but it does not matter. This idea of Republican value as being the base. But in that, we should not forget, as I say, that this is happening in a moment of incredible rolling back on any kind of social laws, of incredible repression, of increased poverty, of the fact that effectively black and you know brown people were sent to the what was called the essential jobs during the pandemic, and they were exposed to the virus and they were exposed to sickness. And the poverty, the anti-migrant laws go along with me. It constitutes an incredible environment, what you know, has been called the hostile environment. And the reinforcement of this hostility is being also a signature of the power in France, you know, for Sarkozy to, um, uh, to Hollande and to Macron. I'm thinking about M. Césaire in discourse on colonialism, which already, you know, in the 1950s, presented, and since we have been talking about fascism and the return of fascism, as you remember in discourse on colonialism, what uh, Césaire analyzed Nazism as a return effect of what Europe had done elsewhere, what they have done, you know, the massacre, the genocide, the dispossession, the exploitation, the enslavement was coming back to them. And what ma was ma constituted the scandal was that white men were doing it to white men. So that in the talk about this return effect, and from this return effect, he will go to the analysis of the French left that he will give in his letter of resignation, a 1956 letter, or letter of resignation to the Communist Party in which he talked about fraternalism, that effectively the left could want brotherhood as long as they will be the big brother. And I do think that this incredible, I mean, this crisis in France is not just the crisis of Macron, the crisis, but the crisis also of the left that has not really decolonized itself, that has not taken the question of racism as really a central question in the making of France, in the making of its law, of its philosophy, of its culture, of its literature, of its society. And that is being effectively addressed in the movement, in the social movement from below, as Aurea was saying, that the yellow jacket started to realize and that you have more and more from below on, on the ground an understanding of what is racial capitalism and that there is no capitalism without racism and there is no racism without capitalism and that Islamophobia today is what the right and a part of the left and a part of the left, especially the Socialist Party, hope to make, you know, the glue that will hold the white, a white Christian French imaginary community that will allow them to, be, to, to remain in power. But this remaining in power of Islamophobia goes along with police violence, with incredible militarized street, with the repression, with also, as I say, separating family, taking Muslim children 
from their family. I mean, really disciplining everyone and allowing, and this is absolutely colonial practice. This has not changed since, you know, the essence of men is being configured and reconfigured, but it's being there. So this is how effectively how the French colonial narrative still play a role, but at the same time is being constantly contested, contested sorry, every day, today, more than ever, and more and more by a lot of young people today. In the school, in the university, in the art, everywhere there is a contestation, an understanding of the necessity of building alliance, complicity, and alliance and to see Islamophobia not just something as anti-Muslim, but as something that is part of the huge you know, construction of social engineering that seek to discipline the entire society and reinforce the author authoritarian police uh, regime that is being really, you know, uh, I mean, and so if you do, I mean, oh yeah, I was talking about demonstration and marches. In any demonstration and marches now, there is an incredible deployment of police and uh, there is a constant effectively police violence, but this police violence does not stop at the march. It's also now in the surveillance and control of, of, uh, of uh, all this, people who dissent in the fact that even the family, the children can be taken and judged and minor are being judged as adult more and more are considered adult. And this is also part of this incredible disciplining of, uh, uh, of you know, um, Muslims in France. Thank you. Oh, I Thank had you, say five minutes left, but it you, was... You, no. Yeah, yeah. You have still time if you want to finish anything. No, that well, I was trying to keep my time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Francois. Uh, this is, was a, a, an interesting uh, take on, on on the historical evidence of of how the the, the present revealed many of the uh, colonial and imperial notion of considering. Uh, non-dominant white French in, in, in a, uh, within and beyond the French borders by the French state. So before we go to our uh, Q and A's, uh, I would like just to welcome back Francois, if he have final remark, you would like to conclude because we lost you. So we'll give you five minutes if you uh, have any- No, no, thoughts. 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Okay. I was to conclude on the comparison and I, I almost ended. Um, you know, I, I, I reminded you that in the early 80s, we had people who in the name of struggling against capitalism would kill, would murder uh, businessmen, okay? Uh, how would you appreciate the efficiency of the response of the French state if to struggle against those, um, uh, murderers of capitalists, we had dissolved and prohibited the entire workers' union, the CGT, the CFDT, and the uh, more or less uh, CIA-born um, uh, force uh, ouvrière. You didn't know this. Huh? Um, it, it would have appeared totally opposite to uh, the uh, interest of, of the state of preventing those who were legally, in the name of, 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 of that, the syndicates, the, the workers' unions, they are also struggling against capi capitalists. So we would have suppressed, and this is exactly what the French state has done recently, two weeks ago, when he has dissolved a uh, very legalist, very pacifist NGO, which was struggling against the excess of uh, Islamophobia. This was my conclusion and thank you for uh, allowing me to conclude and uh, allow me also to express my, my warm admiration uh, for uh, Francoise Verges' uh, last uh, intervention. Thank you, Francois. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so uh, we're going to transition into the uh, Q&A. And please, for the panelists themselves, if you, if you have a question for your colleague, you can actually ask uh, uh, your co-panelists. 
but let's start. I, I, I see uh, two questions here. Uh, one from uh, Mariam addressed to Ramon. Uh, she's asking, you provided an explanation of the context nourishing Islamophobia and racism among the white working class. She asked, but how could we explain the rise of Islamophobia among other classes, such as journalists, teachers, business people, etc.? Yes, uh, the, the ideology of Islamophobia, uh, as well as other forms of racism, because I consider Islamophobia as a form of racism, uh, is, is something that is there embedded in the, um, in the culture and the, like Francois said, since colonial times in, uh, in metropolitan societies, not just France, in metropolitan societies in general. And, and that is there uh, and has been there for a long time. Now, in terms of, uh, so it has a colonial root of which everybody in the society somewhere or another is participating or complicit or, you know, into this kind of, if we understand racism as structural racism, uh, in a sense, people living in metropolitan centers have some kind of benefit from the imperialist system of domination, exploitation of, of the rest of the world, you know, including, you know, people who are affected by the same discourses of racism, you know, so this, this there is a, there, a, uh, of course, different layers and different uh, in different uh, nuances we have to make there because, of course, people affected by racism are in the worst situation in metropolitan centers. Okay, um, but at the same time, uh, uh, there is some kind of uh, uh, appropriation of wealth from the rest of the world that somewhere or another, you know. Uh, indirectly or directly uh, uh, benefits some of, you know, most of the population in the first world. So I would say there is a kind of a deal in the, in the first world, I was mentioning the working classes, uh, but it's also, you can include there, you know, other, other classes in the society who have a, a direct benefit from the system of imperialism by all the privilege that they get through the domination, exploitation of their countries of the rest of the world. The thing, the reason I focus on working classes is that because uh, in a sense, working classes uh, are in a, situa in, a, in a contradictory situation, but on the one hand, they are exploited by, uh, you know, as in their labor with, with you know, capitalists, et cetera. But on the other hand, they receive benefits uh, compared to any other working class in the world. You know, uh, they receive a lot of benefits uh, from salaries and conditions of living uh, in this uh, imperialist uh, kind of uh, uh, deal or pact. And you have, uh, this is a term used in the, for a long time in the social movement about the workers aristocracy. But what this left movement miss is the question about uh, you know, in the concept of work aristocracy, is the question of racism and is the question of colonialism. That is how these two things tie together in an ideology that the arist workers aristocracy that are living off the imperialist system and have and feel they are more uh, benefit more by aligning with the, their own bourgeoisie in the exploitation of third world workers or in the a, a racialization of, of workers, non-white workers in their in their own country, they feel they gain more, you see, than uh, going against uh, or, or than going together with the exploited workers of the third world or the exploited workers inside their own country. Now, with the crisis of that we're living, you know, of capitalism today, and uh, then you have a situation where uh, the contradiction uh, between that deal between the, the workers and their own bourgeoisie, their own capitalists, and the French state as an imperial state uh, becomes in, goes into shackle because now in, this, in the middle of this crisis, they're not getting exactly the kind of concession and living condition 
that they were accustomed to get, you see? And so with the decline of the West internationally, you know, in terms of the, with the rise of China and so on, these countries do not have any more the same resources. Then with the economic crisis, financial crisis, it gets even deeper. So now what, what do you do from the point of view of the imperialist system to get these workers on their side? These have been said now by all the speakers now, uh, which is, uh, you, you know, racism becomes, the, the, the race card comes in as a way to, to glue, cement the workers into the imperialist project by using, in the case of France, the secularist ideology, uh, you know, and using Islamophobia uh, as a kind of split between workers to keep them divided and keep the white workers on the side of white supremacy and the white supremacy imperialist capitalist system. So, uh, but this, as Francois mentioned, has also its contradiction because there's more and more people, uh, and as Huria mentioned, you know, uh, there's more and more people in the streets from white population also challenging, you know, the, the state and the system. So, uh, you know, um, and so this is a, a, a very contradictory situation. And so what the state does is then an offensive, going to an offensive, instead of becoming defensive, they go into the offensive of pushing forward all these laws, you know, that are going to, in a sense, institutionalize in a more solid way what was already uh, there, which is institutional racism and Islamophobia then becoming the, the way to get the workers on their side against other workers and split the working class along racial lines. And this is a, a, an, old, an old strategy, an old tactic used, especially in moments of crisis. We saw that in the 1930s in Europe, Germany, et cetera, other places where they were using the antisemitism as the way to, uh, to challenge the discontent of working classes, not against the system, not against the capitalist system, not against the financial capital of the state, but against other people that are in a sense, uh, you know, uh, other eyes, uh, you know, so that instead of working classes fighting their own, their main enemies, they start fighting other workers who are in worse situation than them. And that's a perfect deal. You could see that in the US with this, let's make Ameri white America great again, Trump, and making the target where wh white working classes who lost their homes, who are in a very bad situation, they made them believe that their main enemy and the people taking their jobs away are the Latinos crossing the border or are the Muslims or the blacks and so on. I mean, and so this is a, an old strategy that it comes back with nuances and with uh, new elements uh, and that we need to pay attention. That's why I was focusing on working classes and that doesn't mean that doesn't happen with other classes in the society, I'm just saying that because of the vulnerability of working classes compared to other classes, then the question of race becomes very fundamental, the racism, to keep them on the side of the imperialist white supremacy system. Uh, thank you, Ramon, for this. And we have uh, a couple of questions. So there is uh, the next uh, couple of them is for Faria. Uh, one person said that, uh, you said French Muslims, we will fear to protest and struggle against, I think what they meant to say against oppression uh, they have on. What, what can they do to fight against without being targeted or arrested? This is one question. The second question for you also, Horia, is about your uh, open uh, democracy response to the 100 uh, French academics. What do you think will happen in, in French university? Is the, is the majority of academics sympathetic to the hundreds or not? Do it would be great if you can keep your answer within uh, five minutes limit so we can get the yes, yes, questions. Yes, very, very quickly. Uh, there, there, there was um, an answer to the 100 uh, academics, uh, an answer that was signed by 2000 academics. So against the 100 academics, there was 2000s academics. I think that in the academia, things, um, uh, um, the, 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 the people working in the academia, the academics 
are much more interesting actually than the 100. But in the same time, the 100 are linked to the interests of the power, are linked to the interests of the media. So in one hand, we have many thousands of academics who are very critic, critical to the 100, but the 100 are, have more power than the others. And this is the problem. I think we have, we can have, um, we can have um, people inside the academy who are uh, supporting us, uh, and we are others who are not supporting us, but we who can be uh, who can be in the same time against the 100. It depends. Uh, I think that uh, decoloniality inside the French academia is not so uh, radical. Is is actually is is very. Um, is uh, is not so radical. Is uh, it's it's just the beginning of the penetration of the 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 decolonial thought in the academia. And this is and even if this is a small uh, phenomenon inside the academy, the the white resistance is bigger. Is very is very strong. And this is very uh, surprising when you, when you when you when you know that uh, the, the French academia is far from being decolonial. Uh, it means that uh, the, 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 the academics who are reactionary, I, th I think that they are, um, they, are, um, they are very frightened about the fact that we are progressing. So this is for the second, uh, it was for the second question. What was the, the first question? Sorry, I, I don't, I can't hear. I, for, I forget to unmute myself. So basically the question is what the French people can do to fight against uh, uh, oppression without being targeted or arrested. So, sorry, what, what? So the question was uh, saying that what do you think the French people can do uh, to struggle against oppression without the fear of getting arrested or targeted? The situation today is very difficult because uh, as you know, as we said, uh, Le CCIF, the, the main uh, organization against Islamophobia is now dissolved today. And uh, the another one, Baraka City, is also dissolved. So, for the and and um, and moreover, uh, I think that fifty mosques uh, are going to be uh, closed. Fifty, uh, uh, maybe uh, Francois can uh, can confirm that. I think that fifty uh, mosques are going to be closed. Uh, so now, right now, it's very 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 difficult for Muslims to resists. This is why I think that right now it is the burden of the white left to do something to protect the Muslims and to make them uh, to, to, to make the, the fight possible. Today it's very difficult for the Muslims really. I think that we are going to we organize ourselves in the next few months. Of course we are going to resist but right now it's very difficult. And I, this is why I think that the, um, the demonstration of today was a very good thing. It was not easy to demonstrate against separatism, against Islamophobia, and being 10,000 people in the streets of Paris, surrounded by thousands of policemen, I think that it's a, it's a great thing. We have to continue, of course, but we have we, we need the solidarity, we need the help of, uh, of the, the other European countries, of our comrades all over the world, of, uh, we, we, need, uh, we need solidarity. And we have to, to construct, to build this solidarity. Uh, thank you, Horia. Uh, there is uh, one question also, I think uh, maybe uh, Francois, you can take a lead on this. Uh, I, would, uh, I would love to hear some more clarification on that, as it seems uh, to both misplace a conflation of Islamophobia with Arabism. 
but also uh, sidelines other uh, equally significant events like Afghanistan on the one hand and anti-blackness on the other. I didn't get the question, I'm sorry. The, the, the connection was so weak. Can you repeat it or summarize it? Yeah. So, so the, the question basically, can you hear me well now? Uh, the question asking that to, if you can provide some clarification that we seem we, we misplace or people conflate Islamophobia with uh, Arabism or maybe anti-Arabism, but also in the same process, uh, when we talk about Islamophobia, we also sidelines uh, the significant events like Afghanistan, I believe the war in Afghanistan, on the one hand, and anti-blackness uh, in, in, in the European context. I think that's what the question is. Do we conflate an, uh, Islamophobia with, with anti-Arabism? This is for Françoise, huh? Uh, for anyone, uh, uh, for, you can start, whatever one of you, Francois or Francois, whatever want to start on taking this question. I think Francois, Francois definitely will start. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, je, I'm sorry, I, je crois que c'était pour vous, Francois. <laughs> bon, bon, bien sûr. No? Essayez de botter en tout, parce que je ne, même, même répéter, il n'y a pas de problème linguistique, mais je ne comprends pas exactement le sens de la question qui nous est posée. Bon, Est-ce qu'il y a une confusion entre arabité et islam Oui, elle est ancienne. In English, euh... in English. In English. <laughs> yeah, speaking in French. Well, you know, I, I'm going to switch to Arabic within 10 minutes uh, and I'm all mixed <laughs> up. Um, no, uh, I, I'm sorry. Even, even without any linguistic problem, I did not get the bottom of this question. Is that the question between, uh, is there... Um, Maybe I, can, I, I, think, I think the question was sorry. I think the question was directed at Huria. It was referring to an article, the interview that Huria did for Verso, in which she talked about um, Islamophobia being sim uh, a condensation of anti-Arab racism. I think that was what the uh, question was directed at. Uh, okay. Maybe could ask a broad the broader question, including Huria's uh, article. But how to delineate anti-Arabness from anti-Muslimness, and also how to how do we look at race within the discourse? And sometimes Islamophobia or Islamicizing the problem as a way to really not address the issue of racism, the long history of race as a category within the French. So I I say always you Islamicize the problem in order to secretize the solution. So once you put that this is a problem of uh, the Muslims, now only the agency of security in the same way of the colonial discourse. So maybe we could just frame a broader question in that way. Go ahead, Horia. The question is, is for me? The, it was written for you to, about your article that uh, it's in the question and answer box. Okay. Uh, it's in the recent interview that you had with Verso. Uh, I, okay, it, it was, uh, yes. I, I, I'm not sure to have understood, but um, um, uh, I think that Islam in France, it's, it's not the only role of Islamophobia, of course, but in France, um, uh, Islamophobia is targeting mainly and only the Arab people. Uh, we have a lot of uh, um, Africans who are Muslims in France who are not directly targeted by Islamophobia. And uh, uh, what is interesting with Islamophobia for the racists is that it's a more respectable way of being racist because it's difficult to be anti-Arab. Anti but being anti-Islam uh, uh, is much more easy to be to be racist because it's not against Muslim, it's against Islam, just like they are against uh, Christianity or the church, etc, etc. It's a, a way of being uh, of it's a way of being racist, but from a more a most respectable uh, uh, point of view. I don't know if uh, if it's understandable. And, and other panelists, if you have any take on, on these questions of, you know, the having 
buzz, which it seems a threat among all the questions. Do we, uh, especially in France, when we talk about Islamophobia, uh, we relate it only to anti-Arab Arabness, but we forget that it's also anti-blackness. What's the relationship between these two category of, of racism or structural racism that 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 emerged from anti-blackness and now uh, end up with anti-Arabs, anti-Muslims in general? Go ahead. Very briefly, we can say that racism in France, historically speaking, has moved from Arabness to Islamness. This is one, one first point. But if we want to be very accurate, we must take into consideration that there has been an, ev an evolution in, in the uh, surrounding Arab uh, world, is the fact that the political lexicon, which was mainly concentrated upon Arabness, there, there was the time of Nasser, there was the time of Arab unity, and it is true that this vocabulary has moved toward Islam on political Islam, giving more visibility, making people link more automatically uh, um, political players, not with their ethnicity, but with their religion. This is part of the landscape. Now, I kindly disagree with Horia when she says that a lady with a hijab, if she's not an Arab, will not face Islamophobia. I'm not, I'm not really convinced. I am convinced, uh, and I, I had to say it in other context, if you put a hijab on any lady uh, uh, on the surface of the planet, uh, whether she would be Chinese or black or whatever, she will face Islamophobia. So I, I'm, not, I'm not really fully convinced that Arabness uh, is, the, is the core of this uh, uh, reaction, racist reaction now in France. This racism is against all the symbols of the belonging to the uh, Muslim religion. I will, I, may I add something? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, you know what, uh, when say, I agree also with uh, what Francois was saying, but what we are saying that the displacement of the fact that, you know, with Islamophobia, there is something also that can encode in France, in a society that is very anti-religious, you know, where the secularism is taking so much importance in this, you know, idea of one's identity. And so by the displacement that it's like a racism that does not, you know, has apparently nothing to do with race, you know, but everything to do with culture, a, a way of being. And so this displacement also allow, I mean, justify almost. And Islamophobia, it's much more easier as we, I mean, to justify, to legitimize that saying, you know, we are against Arab or we are against black. So Islam is a, almost, you know, in a, in a country like France, and especially because it's a religion and that France wants to present itself as, you know, like the, the secular society, the society that is being built, the Republic was built on that. It's hollow that. And so it plays also, it can play in the society. And uh, quite often, you know, effectively with the veil and the hijab, what is being sent back, to, right, uh, right back by anyone in France would say, that's oppression. That's oppression, that's domination. That's, you know, a, a violation of rights. So it's allowing you to say, to move that. And then for instance, uh, you know, it will play with a lot of things. I mean, Algeria, I mean, Algerian war still play a role. And the fact that, you know, uh, the women there were sent back after independence were sent back to the kitchen and the women who fought against, you know, the veil over there and are being harassed. So there was a constant, you know, I mean, shift towards apparently it's not about the people it's about their culture their custom their tradition which are again i mean which are violating uh, human rights and equality of rights and and republican value so but uh, if a uh, woman i mean black women who are uh, wearing the veil or the, the effectively are also harassed in france but the, the question of i mean anti-blackness in france and and um, Islamophobia uh, need to be perhaps effectively uh, refined and clarified. It will not be easy to talk about it like that in two minutes. It will need really like more, more uh, um, 
I, I will not want to speak about that in one minute. It's, it, it will need more uh, explanation. Thank you. Thank you. May, may I say something else? Uh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I will give you that. Yeah. But can I pass this question to you? Also, you take the lead on it. Uh, there is two general questions. It seems flowing around. One is what's the difference? Goodbye to everyone. Allow me to say goodbye to everyone. I'm sorry, I must disconnect. Bye bye, Yana. I was so glad to be with you. Thank you so Thank much, Mansoua. Thank you. Bye bye. Salut. So the, the, the question, Ramon, you can start with your answer, but this is a question in general, uh, what's the difference people ask between Islamophobia and anti-Semitism? Second, well, the second question is, what what the reaction of the general French public to uh, Islamophobia uh, that, uh, that's taking place right now? But yeah, please. Well, first of all, I was uh, exactly dealing at least with the first question because there's no more, no, not a lot of time. But uh, I just want to say that following Francois Berges, uh, that there is an artist, uh, Daniel Ortiz, uh, who is Peruvian from Peru, but based in Barcelona for many years. She put forward a project where she took the Spanish press and she she put all the news about Muslims in a newspaper. She printed a newspaper where she only switched uh, where it says mosque, put synagogue, where it says uh, Muslim, put Jewish, uh, Jews, where it says Islam, he put Judaism. And it was really, really very, very shocking because he was uh, reading a paper, a newspaper in Nazi Germany in the 1930s or in the Vichy regime in the, in the 1940s. And she tried to do the same project uh, in France using the French press, but she was banned from, in France, she couldn't get any support from any museum, any, any institution, our institution to do this. And I'm saying this because of the question, because in many ways there are very strong continuities of the kind of anti-Semitic fascist discourse of the 1930s with today's Islamophobia. But there is an important shift here, which is that there today in many ways, Jews has been incorporated through the project of Zionism, through the project of, you know, the denazification after second world war, they've been in a sense integrated into the white world in many parts of the West, okay? And so now what is perverse is that in France, for example, they will prioritize anti-Semitism when in fact, anti-Semitism is a minor thing today in France compared to anti-Black racism or Islamophobia, but they will prioritize anti-Semitism in a perverse way to basically say that the perpetrators of anti-Semitism are the Muslims because they are criticizing Israel and et cetera, et cetera. You know, so, so Zionism comes in here to complicate things because on the one hand you have Zionist foundations funding extreme right groups in Europe today. On the other hand, you have a, this perverse divide and rule where they put this thing anti-Semitism as the main problem of racism in Europe today and in France to basically hide the Islamophobia and anti-Black racism, which is the most prevalent form of racism in Europe today and in France today. But they do it in a, in a very perverse way to basically accuse Blacks and Muslims who happen to be critical of the policies of, of Israel, of Zionism, to basically say they are the most, they are the causation of racism in our societies, not white supremacy. It's the Muslims who are criticizing Israel, who are anti-Jew, who are anti-Semitic. And this is the, the perverse situation that is happening today because then the ingredient of Zionism comes in and complicate things in a more, uh, you know, in a more complex way, you know, but anyway, I stop here. Francois, do you have any uh, take on how, uh, what do you think the, the general uh, sentiment within the French public uh, uh, vis a vis I was, the, uh, Well, I will say it's difficult to say just one. I mean, uh, um, uh, last year there was a demonstration, a march against an Islamophobia. Was last year, or yeah? Yes. Was it was last year? Exactly an an. It was one year ago. 
okay, it was a year ago. And yes. it was really, it was the, <clears throat> the association which has been, you know, banned right now. And uh, the le I mean, there was part of the left that joined, I mean, the institutional left, the, the La France Insoumise and other. So there are, there, there are shifts. I mean, this has been the work of, you know, a political anti-racist uh, movement of which, you know, uh, of course, uh, uh, Oria has been part of, but a lot, I mean, a lot of movement has been really, and there is a shift in, in some of these organizations, even political parties, but also some associations. So there is a change of an understanding of what is, you know, Islamophobia and why Islamophobia is important. Is this, you know, fighting against Islamophobia is important. So there is that. There is a we, we cannot say there is one general opinion that will be for or against, but it, uh, it plays. I mean, Islamophobia, as we are, we, we many of us say plays on a lot of things that trigger, uh, you know, in, in the French society will trigger reaction. First, effectively, you know, a very, very uh, orientalist trap that comes back constantly, you know, that, you know, about the society that has not been really. Also, a European, I mean, Denmark and Australia are extremely Islamophobic also, you know, so it's not just France. I mean, there is something in Europe also, through Europe, that also play. Fortress of Europe is also being imagined through Islamophobia, anti-migrant, anti-blackness, but also through Islamophobia. So there is also, also that. So the opinion, it, it will really depend, but uh, of anti-racist movement, but also of the uh, transformation of the left. And there is right now a very strong controversy within this institutional left where you know a lot of I mean the Socialist Party is attacking the other the party which are not taking side on you know again, again uh, Islamophobic side I will say I mean the Socialists for instance are attacking uh, some of the Greens that they they find that the Greens are you know too um, nice you know to Islamogoshist Islamo leftists so there is really a struggle right now in uh, the French uh, opinion. I will say, but as as Uria was uh, was saying, the media the media are really Islamophobic, and all these people who are Islamophobic, eh, the moment they open their mouth or they write something, is in the media. Whereas, I mean, you I mean the veil, for instance, you have like hundreds of people coming to talk about the veil. You never have one Muslim woman who will be in, invited. So there is a construction uh, by the media. But at the same time, there is a lot of work do, you know, going on uh, that we cannot dismiss. And again, a year ago, this uh, demonstration, uh, effectively the, the, the banning of the CCEF has not triggered a lot of uh, protest in France, nor of uh, the Barak city. So there is something, but there is also a climate of fear. I mean, uh, even the League of Human Rights, which is really the oldest association against racism in France, very respectable, very, you know, like absolutely no problem, has been, you know, attacked right now by saying that they were too uh, favorable to, uh, to uh, is, uh, you know, is, uh, Muslims and Islam. So there is, a, there is an offensive, but I will not say that uh, they have won yet. So the, the opinion is really, and I, we see people in the demonstration against Islamophobia. You do, I mean, we see people. Maria, if you have uh, uh, anything to add, you can do that. But also if you can address the question, so what's the way forward somebody ask, uh, uh, utilizing this climate, whatever was its fear or uh, uh, Islamophobic uh, attack by the state. So how do you see our envision the way forward uh, for the struggle within uh, for the French Muslims and others. Well, fighting, you know, continue to fight, continue to organize, continue to write, continue to protest. Uh, right now, I mean, the law, um, the law mm -hmm. will pass. I mean, the, there is one of you know about the police repression has passed. I mean. As I say, since Sarkozy and Hollande and Macron, all the laws are being, you know, voted, and so, and they are really uh, creating an atmosphere of vulnerability and precarity, and also of uh, repression of dissent, of any kind of dissent. People helping migrant, people helping. I mean, so yeah, the, the situation uh, is really um, reinforcing this authoritarian, uh, you know, regime. 
and also the, the power of the police. The power of the police is being really, through this law, is being really reinforced. I mean, the police is going to have a power that they did not have before, and the tribunal also. So yes, there is a, uh, they are trying really to uh, contain the insurgency. They are really afraid. I mean, this is also, we can say, the measure of their fear. I just want to add something before leaving because I have to go. Uh, I think that uh, we have to be aware, uh, uh, Francois told about the, 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 the next elections that are going to occur next, uh, next year. I think that it's important maybe to think right now with, uh, with the organizers about uh, uh, an international event that can be, uh, that can be organized in, in France. I think that uh, on, on these issues before, the, the elections, I think that uh, it would be uh, politically very important to do. I think we have to, to think about that. And uh, I think we, we're going to, 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 to talk with uh, Francois, with Francoise, with other people and, and try to think about what we can do with, uh, with you, with all, uh, with all of us. Is and the thank election you in 2021 or 2022? I think uh, it, it has to be in 21 because the, the elections are going to, to be on uh, May 22, 22, April or May 22. So we're, we will commit ourselves to doing something in December yes. again. And if nothing, we also we could uh, do it during the spring period as well. Yes. Uh, so yes. definitely that's something to begin to think about. Yes. and. From a, just the a documentation process, we also need to find ways to uh, carry on some of the work of CCIF because yes. the process of documentation is very critical. So we have to put our heads together to see how uh, to do that. Of course, let's stay in touch and we, we'll talk about that in the Absolutely. few months. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Horia. And uh, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, Francoise, if you have anything you would like to uh, uh, finish well, us up in the next couple of minutes. Well, I will say, I mean, in the question of uh, racism as, as, a, as a really like a political question is very important. I mean, the, all the, you know, anti-blackness or Islamophobia is, has to be really brought as a political struggle not just as a struggle against discrimination, has to become really central uh, to uh, uh, the fight for, uh, you know, uh, justice, but, uh, you know, uh, no justice, no peace. So for justice and peace and dignity, uh, really, I mean, there are also lawyers mobilizing. I mean, there are things going on. I mean, we, I cannot say that there are nothing. I mean, people are really protesting every day in every manners, writing, doing, you know, um, conference, round table, uh, something, uh, it's, it's, but also with, with the confine, you know, the lockdown was difficult to meet also. I mean, we have been also in a very difficult situation. I mean, uh, really. And also we, we have to say, this is will go with an incredible economic crisis. I mean, there is already 1 million poor, more poor people in France. So we have also to connect all these questions together we have to make, you know, really not just, uh, but I do think that uh, uh, anti-racism in the political sense of it, the, the fact that racism is a foundation of the, this, you know, regime, police regime, whatever, is not just, you know, a consequence of it has to become. And I will say that uh, it's, it's better than it was uh, 10 years ago, five years ago. So we have to continue. I mean, I do see, as Oya was saying, more and more uh, scholars and academic, and you have books also being published, and you have a, a colloquium and podcast, I would say. It's not just marches and protest. So there is something, but also I will say that uh, uh, we have uh, to build also on the European level. You have us to be a target also, because what you see happening, I mean, Australia is preparing a law that will be even uh, uh, more terrible than the one in France on, on, on you know, repression of Islam that they call separatism, but it's you know, against, uh, against Muslim. So, uh, and Denmark is also having incredible laws, uh, you know, repressive law against family, against white women. So there is something also of, of uh, 
a reinvention of Europe, you know, uh, through uh, Islamophobia. I mean, the, the identity that this beginning of 21st century of reinventing Europe through also there was Brexit. I mean, there is also all this happening and the rise of the far right. And as I say, a new generation of new people on the right, not just the old Le Pen family, but new one, more dangerous. And um, so there was really anti-racism and the connection with uh, anti-capitalism is really for me, uh, really that, that uh, this struggle against Islamophobia uh, will also, you know, take that dimension. Um, thanks, Francis. Uh, uh, Ramon, you have, uh, uh, we, we have a couple of minutes if you have well, anything you would like okay, to Okay, no, just, just following on Francois' point, I mean, I think the weakest link right now is the political left in France that is not to the level of the of the moment? You know, the political left in France right now, they're too much complicit with Islamophobia, with secularism. You know, in the worst, uh, uh, you know, in the worst ideological way you can imagine, and 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 then they are in a sense uh, so complicit that that then it becomes very difficult to build alliances needed, urgent in this moment, you know, between, you know, the, uh, you know, Muslim community, black community and others community victims of racial capitalism and, uh, and the, the white working classes. And, uh, you know, so the, the, the missing link here is the French left. I think there are too much complicit with the with the republicanist ideology with the you know um, with the same uh, racist discourses mobilized by the right that makes the situation very difficult to build a political movement because what francois and huria are pushing for is for a political response it cannot be just another protest or manifestation against racism it has to be a political project you know, to challenge the power structures of the society. And for that, you need a broad alliance between the people who are victims of racism and the people who are victims of maybe, you know, a, a, a capitalism a, in the, you know, and, and working classes, I mean, you know, in a broad sense that could get together and fight back. Right now, the missing link is the French left and the weakness is the, uh, you know, the Islamophobic, uh, and racist discourses that are still uh, very much uh, powerful among white working classes and the uh, French westernized left. Mm -hmm. It's a very, and, uh, I agree, Ramon, it's a very disciplining tool also. Yeah. Very disciplining. Yeah. And so we they, have to overcome that fear also of being disciplined through Islamophobia or, you know, also as you were saying, through, you know, the censorship of BDS, you know, that's a powerful tool of disciplining, of being accused of this, you know, it's yeah. a, so we have to overcome that fear. Yeah. Excellent. This is, uh, goes without saying that uh, really you, all of you try to tackle so much in very uh, uh, few minutes, but I really, something will take away with me is uh, Francois, you, you, you suggested that there is no racism without uh, capitalism and there is no capitalism without racism. And, and to Ramon's point, to create this wide uh, uh, front for anti-racist, anti-capitalist, it, it just has to be a completely different project for re-envisioning tomorrow and how tomorrow looks like. Uh, whether that in France or the other side of the Atlantic or the European context. So I really thank you so much, Francois, Horia, uh, Francois, Ramon, for a uh, wonderful engagement and public discourse. And I will turn it to Hatim uh, just to let us know what the next uh, panel looks like. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, see you thank for you. sure next year. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you, Francois. And uh, Horia, welcome, and also Francois Brogat, who left, uh, left earlier. Uh, this is a good uh, start for us in this conference, and uh, definitely we will build on. We have three other panels. We have a second panel coming up, uh, which is uh, really, we have 
three speakers, three wonderful speakers that are gonna engage and continue in this discussion. I see Hamza, I see Asif, and I see Ibrahim as well. Uh, it's good to see you and uh, uh, hopefully that we will build on these questions. Uh, just to come out from the first one, I think there's an important questions in terms of the Islamophobia, how it's connected to race and racism. That's a broader conversation, which I think some of us have been working on this field and how the racialization of Muslims is connected uh, to the whole field of race and racism. Uh, the issue of the left uh, in France uh, and how it uh, really reflects the same broader discourses on Islamophobia and has not yet divorced itself from also racism in general. So the fact that we have a racism of the right and racism of the left. Uh, so those are the discussions. And then the other questions is what type of solidarities and what type of work that we really need to think about uh, moving forward, uh, because this issue is gonna be with us not only in France, but also other parts uh, of the world. As Francois mentioned, the development in Austria, in the UK, in Denmark, in Netherlands, and then the whole questions uh, in the United States and Canada. Uh, since some of the uh, policies that are adopted in France tend to make its way to uh, Quebec, especially with the hijab ban. So these are no longer isolated, even though we study each of these uh, examples, uh, we are constantly making comparisons and trying to document what is taking place. So now I'm gonna turn the uh, next session to my dear friend and brother, uh, his neighbor, but we don't see each other these days because of shelter in place. Uh, uh, Munir Jiwa is the founding director of Center for Islamic Studies and assistant professor of Islamic studies at the Graduate Theological Union. It's also an important partner in the work of Islamophobia that we do at UC Berkeley as well as internationally. So Munir, it's good to see you. Uh, it, the floor is yours and take us through the next panel. Thank you, Dr. Hatham. Salaam alaikum to everyone. And uh, first, I just wanna start by thanking you, uh, Hatham, for, for your incredible work and, um, and creating this global uh, um, network uh, of scholars and uh, many of us friends uh, over the years. So it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure um, to, to be here uh, to be part of this uh, uh, larger sort of, in some ways, solidarity movement uh, in, in and of itself. Um, and, uh, and especially how we are bridging the academy uh, and the academic work, uh, data-driven work with, with organizations uh, beyond the academy. So I just wanna start off with thanking you, Hatem, and thanking all our colleagues here and, and all the participants uh, who, are, who are joining us. Um, I also, you know, as, as, as you just mentioned, uh, Hatem, that, you know, part of uh, this work, even though it's specifically uh, this conference is around Islamophobia in, uh, in France, we see that uh, there, that Islamophobia is global, right? And we see it uh, in all sorts of movements and in, in various ways, uh, some patterns across the world, and then some specific ways in which this manifests in different contexts. So whether we're looking at, um, India, whether we're looking at Myanmar, uh, China, uh, or, the, or uh, parts of the, the West, uh, we see these overlaps and the rise of white supremacy and ethno-nationalism. Um, so, um, uh, so as we're, as we're uh, hearing our colleagues today and thinking about this, um, you know, we're thinking comparatively as well, because there's a lot, of, uh, a lot to learn from, from these different uh, contexts that we're in. Um, and I also want to thank, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Al Sadiq because of the uh, well, the important panel that just came before, and also his his important work uh, um, at, at Berkeley as well, and 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 the work he's been doing on Islamophobia and ethno nationalism. So I want to start by thanking him as well. Um, so we have a great uh, group uh, together. We have a little bit more time, but I still want to hold us to 20 minutes. Um, and I'll do, uh, I'll introduce each of uh, the three of you as you speak. Um, and I'll do the shorter bios. Uh, everyone's welcome to look up there. Uh, wonderful bios and uh, all the incredible work and publications everyone's doing. 
um, but we'll, we'll keep the bio short and give uh, the speakers more time. And if you have questions, please uh, include them in the chat. I'll just do my best to keep, keep on top of the, uh, the questions. Um, I think some are going to the chat, some are going to the Q&A, so we'll try to uh, field them uh, together at the end. Um, our first speaker is uh, Asif Arif, who is an attorney, uh, attorney admitted to the Paris Bar and the author of multiple books on Islam and secularism in France. Um, he will speak today on the evolution of legislation regarding terrorism and secularism in France. So welcome, uh, Asif. Uh, thank you very much, Munir. Uh, welcome, it's, uh, assalamu alaikum everybody. Hello to everybody uh, for, and, and I'm really grateful actually, I never, uh, was aware about these conferences and uh, when uh, Professor Hatem talked to me about it, I was very glad to uh, be a member and participate in, uh, in this beautiful panel. Uh, some introductory remarks about the evolution of legislation in France uh, about uh, secularism and terrorism. Uh, the thing is, if, you, if, you, if we need to understand what is happening currently, we would need a much more wider uh, law perspectives. So we would have to even take in consideration immigration law, which has some effects on Islamophobia. The, uh, the secu secularism, definitely the evolution of secularism, the criminal uh, in some sense, because all these anti-terrorist uh, authorities that have been implemented by laws and, and, and by the recent actually developments uh, of legislation would, would have been a, 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 a type of explanation of how Islamophobia is construed in France. Uh, but uh, we'll uh, just, just talk about these two and, and I think that they'll, they'll keep me quite a, a bit of time uh, to, to talk about those. Uh, just one or two things before starting the uh, hardcore uh, law uh, on these subjects is, uh, first we were talking, Françoise Vergès was mentioning the Austria law. Uh, but today we had the constitutional court who overturned uh, the law. This is a good news. So uh, we can applaud that uh, constitutional court who overturned the law because it will lead to stigmatization against Muslims. So this is a very good news. And I think this uh, case precedents and in general, different case precedents shall be used in our uh, struggle against Islamophobia because often courts are much more moderate than political instances or uh, different um, uh, militant voices, even militant voices, including those who struggle against Islamophobia. You know, they don't always have uh, this backdoor saying, no, uh, he's too uh, militant, he's too left uh, oriented, he's too uh, right oriented. We, well, we always uh, put a sticker on the face of these person who are speaking. So case precedent is a good way in order to uh, give the debate a certain form of objectivity. And this constitutional court of Austria uh, can be a good first point. The second element is the Supreme Court of France, Conseil d'État, the administrative side, uh, because our uh, uh, su Supreme Court system is divided into judiciary and administrative. The Supreme Court administrative side, the Supreme Administrative Court said that the menu, substitutional menu, uh, which is proposed in Cantine in, in France, is authorized. So it, it seems very awkward to come in the 21st century and have to interrogate a court of law about, is it authorized to have a menu without meat? But this is where we are in France. We are now requesting by petition, by motion to court, that are we allowed to have menu without meat? This, this is where we are uh, in France and people who don't even, and at the same time, you have a political debate and political institution who don't even want to talk about Islamophobia, right? <laughs> so this is the, 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 this is the funny parallel in between these two uh, notions. Now coming to the law about secularism, uh, those are really important because, uh, and I will start right, uh, uh, I was, uh, planning to start before 1905, the law of separation of churches and state, but I think I will start right on 1905. Uh, 9 December 1905, the uh, French uh, parliament passes this law separating the churches and the state. So basically the main base of this law was to uh, give favor to freedom of conscience. Of course, everybody is being the, the spiritual authorities being separated from the temporal 
authority. And this way of doing was in order to ensure more autonomy to churches and more autonomy to state for uh, the policy implementation. So um, what happened in 1905, so, so this is why the, the law do not talk about secularism per se. So the law do not talk about laicite, the term that is used by French legislation or French political debate in order to talk about secularism. Laicite has never been mentioned once in the 1905 law. So it's out of the law. It's a, it's a, it's a philosophical concept that have been uh, construed over the time. And uh, uh, the, the law just implement the neutrality of any person representing the state against citizen of the country. And the citizen of the country are diverse and are, have the right to uh, proclaim their faith, they have the right to publicly express their faith, and they have the right to um, uh, the, the freedom of religion, the basic freedom of religion. Uh, and it, it, will be, it, will, it goes beyond the freedom of religion because it's freedom of conscience. So anybody who don't have any faith also has the right to be in the French Republic uh, as diverse as he is. But the first element that maybe explain the Islamophobia today is that right in 1905, the question of Algeria came up. And uh, we wonder if Algeria will uh, be a country where we can implement and apply political secularism, laicite. And the response was from the French government, no. So they create an exemption for Algeria, considering that Muslim are not able to uh, live within a secular state. So that, that, that's, that's the first element, maybe the specificity of treating the Muslims comes from a, a colonial, colonial uh, reflex, which is from this period of time of Algeria, this exemption by law. And uh, the second element also that needs to be uh, underlined here in the 1905 law is when Jean Jaurès made this law and he was pleading the case of the law in front of the National Assembly, the question of atheism came because today the way we're seeing the, 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 the state is the state is almost putting into perspective a state atheism. And the, the question of notifying the atheist uh, faith or philosophy of uh, French Republic was asked to Jean Jaurès. And Jean Jaurès at that time in 1905 refused to uh, subscribe to that analyst and refused to put the term atheism within the law because he said atheism is a philosophical point of view which is not compatible with laicite, with secularism, because secularism is neutrality, neutrality from early philosophical or religious opinion. So these are the two elements that are really important to understand why we're here now. And these are two um, very important arguments to tackle whatever uh, you have uh, Islamophobic speech uh, uh, in front of you, and even up to today, because I will come to these recent laws as well. But where the uh, situation start getting really, start really messing up with Islam, you could say it's 1989, where uh, there was these two uh, young uh, ladies where went to the school with the headscarf on, and then it created polemics and national polemics and the government uh, decided to have the advice of the Supreme Administrative Court. And in 1989, the Supreme Administrative Court said something very reasonable and uh, this something very reasonable is often forget by a lot of people that the Supreme Court said, if there is no proselyte type of gesture or act or positive attitude to force forcibly pick a person and tell her to accept the other's faith, it cannot be considered as a infringement to political secularism. As a, as a, it cannot, it's not contrary to laicite. It's not contrary to the 1905 law. So that's very, very important because here the Supreme Court laid down a foundational basis on what we can consider as a violation of 1905 law. So if there is a positive and active attitude, proselyte attitude, and almost aggressive attitude of one student to tell the other student to accept his fate or to uh, wear the headscarf or whatever. It's compulsion, compulsion is required. And, this, and the Supreme Court has said this other thing, 
and, and I think it was a beautiful reasoning at that time, uh, is other, other than this case scenario, any other scenario will be considered as in compliance with the 1905 law and will be considered as having no relationship at all with the violation of 1905 law and will be considered under the umbrella of freedom of conscience and freedom of religion. And so that was a very, very nice advice that uh, the uh, Supreme Administrative Courts uh, gave in 1989. And it's an advice, it's not a case precedent uh, because our Supreme Court has two functions. It can give an advice to the government, but at the same time, it has a jurisdictional uh, judiciary type of, and it can render case precedent. But in this specific case, it was an advice formation. Then after 1989 and till up to 2004, the case precedent were pretty much following whatever the Supreme Court has laid down, this foundational requirement of proselytism. So that was really good because uh, all the case precedent were pretty neutral. Uh, often Muslim were uh, winning cases. Um, and I think there was one or two laws that I can find the reference if needed, but uh, I think there were one or two, but that, that was very specific type of situation in which uh, they, they, they assess a loss in their case. But in 2004, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy started saying, no, we have to, it was Nicolas Sarkozy, there was, Jean, yeah, there, there was Bayrou as well, uh, there was Jacques Chirac as well, they start saying, okay, the uh, Front National at that time, the far right was getting really up and came to the second tour. So they have to uh, do something about it. So in order to get a little bit of their constituent, they decided to pass this law, um, this 2004 law, and what is best in order to create emotion in the general opinion, to take the question of the kids. It's the best way. You take the question of kids and it goes all emotional. And the emotional is totally adverse normally to a good lawmaking process. Because law cannot be made under emotional distress. It has to be made through objective and through consistent and through very, uh, with wisdom. Law has to be wise. And in these cases, uh, in this case of law of 2004, uh, some even like Jean Bobereau quit the commission. They said, no, it's not acceptable for us, these type of, uh, uh, of behavior because the entire commission was oriented against the headscarf. Although the public announced in the beginning, the public debate was all oriented towards headscarf, but they realized that if we talk too much about the headscarf and we show this law as a law oriented against only uh, and for the headscarf, we're going to have an unconstitutionality pending because 60 a member of parliament, which is the co 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 constitutional council, and the constitutional council will say this law has been made only for one uh, minority, and because it's made by only for one minority, it's, it's deemed unconstitutional. So they had that fear, and it's always that fear. Let me tell you, even today, the separatism law was exactly the same process the same political process came into, into movement. When they start saying it's Islam, it's Islam, it's Islam 24 seven. And at the end they said, oh no, no, we're making a very global, a very general law, you know, where um, Christian will be concerned and we put into the private schooling thing and they mix and match a little bit the disposition of law in order to make it more digestible. And in order for the constitutional council to say, oh, look, we analyzed all these elements and it's pretty constitutional, it's fairly constitutional. And that's what the uh, Supreme Administrative Court said about separatism law recently. Uh, I, I will come back to this because it's very specific. I would like to uh, have a, a proper discussion about this separatism law. Uh, then this 2004 law has been adopted and uh, um, leads to, oh, okay, so we, uh, in college and Lycée high school, and uh, I don't know what's the equivalent, the American equivalent, but uh, uh, anything before university, basically. Uh, it, um, and there is an exception for kindergarten, but they, they were not really into the, the, the polemic at that time. Anything before university, any school or whatever that is related with the public service, French uh, Republican school, in those you cannot wear any religious sign has been codified, it's in the code of education now, it's done. 
So uh, after that, when you open a Pandora box, the problem is that the polemics will keep coming up because you open the fact that we for, uh, we we create a uh, introduction for uh, these kids to wear headscarf. But now what about university? Now what about uh, uh, when they're out of university? Now about public space? Now you open a Pandora box and then it open up to more discrimination. Um, and th these questions ha happen to be in the public debate and whenever political uh, po politics, po uh, politics needs to use it in order to foster their own personal uh, agenda, they will do it because this is a totally free topic, easy topic question. And they know they will have the general public with them because the general public is becoming more and more populist and more and more far right oriented. So when they comes to Nicolas Sarkozy and there were like then you know in 2005 there were the riots and some other stuff happened that and the debate Nicolas Sarkozy opened up the debate I think we slightly touched it before uh, one of the panelists slightly touched it it's the debate on uh, uh, on national identity and they open a lot of uh, uh, other subject and that leads to the necessity of adopting a law uh, and always against the same person and always the same political speech came back again. And the same political speech was about saying, no, 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 it's not about Muslim. We're adopting a very general law, but they were calling it law on burqa. So you see always this double standard of saying something to the general opinion in order to make it pass constitutionally and saying something in media and fostering discrimination in media. What I think, and I, and I already write this very extensively, is that polemics, when they are repetitive, are much more prejudicial for Muslim than a law when it's enforced. Because the law has to be a little bit objective in, in its sense, and they have to, and it's amended, and it's, there's quite a lot of parliamentary process in order to uh, have a law. So, they use this, uh, all, all these 2010 polemics in order to say, okay, we, we voted a law. It called law on burqa all the time, but at the end when it has voted and it's, uh, it's in the uh, official journal of law, it's written law on the dissimulation of the face. So you see, it's, it, they change it completely in order to make it more, um, uh, more easy to digest constitutionally. There's another problem here, is that the, if, the, the efficiency of these law. Look, when, ha when the, this terrorist attack happened in Charlie Hebdo in, um, in 2015, uh, these two terrorists were wearing helmet and there were no commission, no parliamentary commission, no nothing about how this 2000 and law, 2010 law that has to, uh, that forbade any dissimulation of the uh, of the face was applied in these circumstances where they were a scooter wearing big cask, you cannot recognize them. So where how this law didn't came into application, how this law is in general applicable? The, 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 the answer is very simple. This law was not made for the dissimulation of face. This law was made for those who are wearing a full veil, a burqa. It was the burqa law. It was nothing else purely Islamophobic rhetoric behind it. Then we come to uh, François Hollande's uh, president, presidency and François Hollande's presidency, they didn't vote a law per se, unless Loi El Khomri, uh, where in, in the article 1 bis A, they introduced the uh, possibility for any private corporation to uh, have a uh, document, we call it règlement intérieur, uh, some some form of, some form of policy you know internal policy documents in which they can uh, decide that no religious sign can be shown while uh, you are working for our companies so you see another discrimination because again we know that these are made for the Muslim women to not be able to work in those companies. Some companies change their policy. They say, look, we are, uh, they're voting this law. We're doing something completely else, H&M and all that, these AXA, H&M, some insurance companies and all that. So they adopted the charter, uh, the diversity charter. 
There's another uh, document which is chart of diversity that accept anybody of any faith and uh, however he want to come into the private companies. Uh, there was also the regular debate of head headscarf in university. Should we ban it? Should we not ban it? Should we ban it? Should we not ban it? That leads to a lot of frustration because that leads to a lot of problem within universities. Because these debates are very public and media are making it a very echo about these polemics. Uh, what happened is some student who don't even understand, they start going to the director of the establishment and saying, look, there is a problem with these people. They always come uh, with their headscarf. So that trigger problem, actually. Polemics trigger polemics. And, and, and that comes up, that build up. And when this thing builds up in the general opinion, that becomes a law and a political subject. Uh, we also face, uh, during the Francois Hollande's presidency, a lot of problem with Muslim visibility. Uh, it can be Mariam Pushtu, uh, this uh, union uh, president who has been facing very strong adversity in uh, just the fact that she was wearing a headscarf. Uh, it can be Meneli Pchisem, uh, who was uh, get, uh, outed from a show because she was wearing a headscarf. It can be, uh, it, there was some people who do, uh, the humorist Yassine Belata has been regularly attacked on the basis of his Muslimness, you can say. And uh, those who are Muslims, they are all often very qu qualified in the public debate as not really objective. So as always having a problem with the uh, objection and they want to bring Sharia in France and they want to, and they're Islamo-Gauchist, this very expression that has been used now by our ministers. This is unbelievable that our ministers targeted academics, lawyers, militant, as somebody, so, so as people who are giving the ideological base for terrorism. This is what they're saying. I mean, it's completely unbelievable that we came to that level of uh, political speech and political uh, debate today. And uh, then uh, this for, for secularism, I won't come more at because I want to talk at the end, just right before uh, finishing to about uh, the, this, this question of separatism law and the law on global security. Uh, because it's a very, it's a big problem for whistleblowers and, and all of us can be considered as whistleblowers because when we say something about what is happening to one uh, lady who was wearing a headscarf, we are actually alerting people about what is happening with Muslim in France. And that can be a big problem with these two law because there's two disposition when they're merged and combined, uh, it's a complete uh, 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 interdiction to do anything about it. I, I will come to that at the end. So uh, I would just like to mention few laws about um, uh, uh, terrorism now. Uh, well, terrorism, you know, it's, it's also a big thing in Islamophobia because any time that a terrorist attack happened, our governments use it to pass multiple laws, but multiple laws. And whenever they said we all oh, we don't have enough mean in order to uh, combat terrorism, it's a pure lie. If you look at the disposition that they have in law, I think France is the more repressive law about uh, in the uh, counterterrorism law that we have in the Europe. So first, you have the uh, 14th November uh, state of emergency that has been adopted, with specific provision that now it's over but state of emergency has been adopted for 14 days. And in certain parts, it was impossible. It, it was possible for the, you can say it's a type of deputy governor, we call it préfet in French. Uh, the deputy governor of this, of, and they work by region. And this specific region would be able to restrict travel, uh, restrict any, uh, or arrest any person who has created disturbance in public order. What does this disturbance in public order mean? I don't know, uh, prohibit certain public meetings, but why, on which basis? It was pretty general, and it was a large leverage of, uh, of discretionary power uh, given to uh, the, uh, the deputy governor. What happened in the 16th of November, then after he, the François Hollande called the Congress, Congress is uh, when you call the uh, National Assembly and the Senate within Versailles in a huge uh, room, uh, they're all together to vote a law, and it's a very solemn. So everybody's like, "Wow, we we we're tackling terrorism! Finally, we're tackling terrorism!" And he, uh, this is where he suggested uh, the uh, foreseeable relinquishment of nationality 
when he uh, talk about uh, those who are condemned for terrorism and then he stepped back uh, after this and up to today Francois Hollande recognized that that was a big mistake. Um, then after multiple tech, multiple uh, laws were keep um, uh, were, were voted in order to give continuance to the state of emergency who stayed for two and a half years, two and a half years of state of emergency in France. Can you imagine two and a half year in a in a, in an exceptional regime where the deputy governor has almost every judiciary power? every judiciary power. He can raid home, he can decide to give uh, arrested warrant, he can decide to give, uh, he can decide pretty much everything without the intervention of the judiciary. This is very important, without the intervention of the judiciary. This was the main thing. When Emmanuel Macron came and he was, do, he was doing his campaign, he said, look, when I will be president, I will, to, I will step back from the state of emergency. The first thing that I will do, I will stop I would do a controlled exit of the state of emergency. This is the, his terms. But the control uh, exit of the state of emergency was, yeah, uh, was to uh, just make sure that um, he, he, he introduced a subtile dose, dosage of judiciary control within his law. But it was exactly the same of uh, the uh, the, 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 pre, the previous state of emergency. And now up to today, this was the recent development that I wanna talk and I will end uh, uh, then, is uh, this law on global security, the article 24 that has been discussed in parliaments a lot of time in France. And the article, I think it's 47 of the, the separation, separatism law, because I wanna call it separatism law, because it is, the, it is a law that clearly target Muslims. And when you merge them together, it gives you, a complete, complete interdiction to um, whistleblow, say something about something, or to uh, film uh, the police officers. So if you couple these two, you're pretty much done. The state has uh, locked everything in order for the population to start saying that there is some discrimination, there is problems in France. And finally, I would like to say is, I would quote one of my good friends, François Sureau. He's an attorney and he said, look, uh, what is happening in France is we are in a, we open a Pandora box and we're rolling and rolling and rolling. And we're having a law, a law upon law, law upon law, law upon law. And now is always the politics of the one who will go even further because today, even though this proposition, this law proposal went directly to the Constitutional uh, Council and is gonna be denied. But today, an MP, a member of parliament in France proposed to put into retention any person who is radicalized. Would you imagine that radicalization is not even a legally defined process? And he is proposing to do that. Emmanuel Valls proposed to put in uh, forbidding Salafism. Uh, some, uh, and, and we are now, French people are in a mindset of state of emergency. We'll live two years and a half in state of emergency, terrorism, and we are living now for almost a year, so a couple of months now, in the sanitary emergency, which is exactly the same uh, with the lockdowns on, on top of that and all. So we are now adopting a very, uh, uh, an emergency type of state of mind. And then every, anytime that we'll have a terrorist attack, we'll have to come up with a new law. So this is the, uh, the problem in France and we can address it through a different case precedent, but unfortunately I don't have time for developing more on this. Thank you, Asif, that was, was mm -hmm. wonderful. And hopefully the Q and A, we can take up some more of this and of course, the conversation is beyond this conference as well. So the, these conversations will continue, but I just wanna thank you for um, highlighting. And again, we can take this up in, in the Q and A, but the, um, the relationship, I mean, you, you started with the 1905 law and then 1989 and then 2004 and the kind of uh, new sort of the, you know, the terrorism um, 
law uh, now, the law on global security or the separatism law. And uh, what's interesting in all of this is, is, is what you're emphasizing, the, the relationship between law and polemics and media, right? And, and the important points you make around, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the polemics uh, and the repeat, repetition of polemics is, 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 is where we see uh, especially the Islamophobia. So thank you for your important points. That's my sort of brief uh, response, and hopefully we'll we'll take them up in the um, in the Q and A as well. Um, our uh, next uh, speaker, and it's great to see Ibrahim and Hamza again uh, from previous uh, uh, as well. Um, uh, Ibrahim Shuri is a PhD candidate at l'Institut Français de Géopolitique and has been a lecturer also at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Uh, he will speak today on uh, uh, the French Empire Strikes Back, Separatism and Counterinsurgency in Macron, uh, France. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, Salam Alaikum. Um, thank for the uh, introduction, uh, Munir. Uh, it's good to see you again. Um, I want to start by thanking, like, uh, uh, th thanking all the organizers for having me here, for organizing uh, this conference, for making it happen in a much needed time, a time in which Muslim kids are arrested for expressing like un uncomfortable ideas at school, uh, at a time in which organizations such as the CCIF and uh, Baraka City are uh, dis dismantled for no valid reason, and I could go on and on. So uh, I want to, to thank you for organizing that. Uh, right now, it's it's crucial to get an understanding of what's happening uh, in France because it's extremely worrisome. Um, so I'm going to center my presentation on the discourse produced around uh, what Asif called, uh, I think he's right to do so, uh, the law on separatism, uh, rather than the law uh, that is protecting the, the principles of the, the Republic, because that's the way it has been uh, renamed and repackaged. Re um, Separatism in particular, the word separatism is interesting for me because for, for two years I've been interested in uh, the way in which counterinsurgency tactics have been developed and the way in which they're profoundly linked with uh, what happened, especially at the end, but also during the, 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 the tenure of the French uh, colonial uh, empire. Um, so when we think about the word separatism, it's it's one of these new like you know words, but it's it's a new word that is coming to add itself to other words that have been used in the last like you know 20, 30 years um, to really designate like you know particular uh, people. So um, you know it's words like immigrant, uh, radicalization, terrorism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who are used as like you know words that carry like some sort of like you know political. Uh, um, uh, discourse within them, but that really don't um, mean anything per se, meaning that their definition is completely like, you know, all over the place. But at the same time, politically, what they mean is like, you know, the other, the Muslim, the danger in general. Uh, and I think another word that it's, it is important to, to, to bring in here and to explain to uh, an audience that might not be familiar with what's happening in France is the word communitarism. Uh, the word communitarism in France is used to designate any uh, community, um, whether it's like Muslims or like, you know, uh, black people or Desi people or East Asian people or North African people that uh, stay together. It's never used to uh, talk about whites that stay together, but it's a word that is used to talk about all these like, you know, minorities that stay together, live in the same neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, have friends uh, who are of the same, like, you know, uh, uh, um, um, ethnic or racial background or religion as them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And communitarianism is not seen as a, you know, or celebrated as the way in which it, it is in the United States to a certain extent. Uh, it's something that is seen as a as a profound uh, um, faux pas in France, as something that you should not be engaging in because it's already separating yourself or already uh, already like you know putting yourself at a distance from uh, the nation, from the rest of the nation, the rest of the inhabitants of France, the rest of the citizens. And the word separatism is sort of a step, um, uh, one more step in that same direction, uh, except that the word separatism carries something else in it. It carries the fact that uh, it's not anymore just living among ourselves or hanging out with people that look like you or like, you know, living in an area in which people look like you, etc. Uh, it's also getting together with all of these people that look like you 
to separate yourself from the Republic, to separate yourself uh, from uh, the state. And this leap from communitarism to separatism is not uh, innocuous. It's not something that is like, you know, uh, harmless uh, because it allows official entry, in my opinion, in a new parad uh, paradigm of governance, governance through uh, counterinsurgency. I'm going to explain what is uh, counterinsurgency, its origins and why like, you know, it is used now by like, you know, the French government. So um, I want to start with a brief history of what is like, you know, uh, of, of counterinsurgency as a doctrine, as a concept. So counterinsurgency, has been practiced for, um, from my research, um, uh, hundreds of years. Like you can find traces of like counterinsurgency tactics in uh, the Roman Empire. You can find like traces of counterinsurgency tactics in uh, during the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, you can find it uh, in the aftermath of the French Revolution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the way in which it has been reified, defined precisely, and formed as a doctrine happened in over the last two centuries approximately. Uh, it has really been set in stone per se, um, just after the, the, the Algerian war, um, uh, in, in taking into account what the French did during the Algerian war, meaning like, you know, torture, uh, detention camps, um, propaganda, psychological warfare, et cetera, et cetera. All of that has been taken into account by uh, uh, French officers, uh, officers, military officers, mainly Tranqui and Galula, to create the principles of counterinsurgency that has been used uh, by the United States in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, that has been used in many Latin American countries, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in France, what is interesting is that after the Algerian war, after the end of the Algerian, uh, Algerian war, the counterinsurgency uh, doctrine has been forbidden. General de Gaulle, uh, the General de Gaulle, uh, completely forbid the French military from using counterinsurgency tactics because he saw it as something that uh, could be dangerous and also tarnish the image of France uh, overseas. Uh, so the doctrine was forbidden uh, to be used by the military uh, as it is. It has continued to be uh, used by the military without like, you know, calling it counterinsurgency. But more than that, it has continued in France to circulate within like, you know, academic milieu and military milieu, and notably at the French uh, military school. That's what uh, Mathieu Rigoust shows into his book, um, uh, into his book about counterinsurgency and Le Bonnier. Uh, he also shows and explained that there is um, a return, a progressive return of counterinsurgency tactics starting in the 90s to, uh, and even before, to um, actually regulate um, uh, create order within the fr French banlieue. French banlieue are the suburbs of like, you know, French big cities, but are not like, you know, the, the image of like American suburbs that you might like, you know, be having. It's like, you know, uh, project housing, working class people that, that uh, live there uh, with an immigrant background or immigrants themselves, uh, a lot of Muslims too. And that's not like, you know, uh, an information that is uh, uh, um, to be put on the side. Uh, and so it has been like, you know, used at home, meaning it was used in the colony, but it has been transferred in metropolitan France to control post-colonial bodies. So counterinsurgency that was used by the French colonial empire to impose its rules on colonized subjects in the colonies has been brought back to France to control and um, establish uh, um, order within territories in which uh, post-colonial subjects live uh, in France. So now, what is exactly counterinsurgency? Counterinsurgency is a military tactic that is, uh, tactic that is used to preserve order in particular circumstances. Uh, the circumstances to simplify are uh, as is. Uh, it's a circumstance in which you have like basically a population that is divided in three groups. Uh, one rebel minority, a rebel minority that is going against the state, against the nation, a compliant minority that is working for the state, not because they're like, you know, working for the state, paid by the state, but because they like, you know, love the state and want to defend the, the state. And a neutral majority, uh, 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 the majority of people who are neither rebel nor compliant, but could go one way or another, depending on what happens. And the idea of counterinsurgency is to destroy the rebel minority and make sure that the, 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 the neutral majority becomes the compliant uh, or uh, um, joins rather the compliant minority. 
and uh, at no um, at no uh, at all costs not join the rebel minority. I don't know if that's clear what I just said. Um, it works through um, a metaphor, a medical metaphor that brings to overrise the robots, the, the enemy. Uh, in that metaphor, the nation is an organism. The nation is a body. France uh, is a body in, in, in the context that we're talking about right now. Uh, and that's what, like, you know, the French constitution say, France is an indivisible, uh, indivisible like republic. It's one and only, meaning like France is an organism, a body. And part of it, part of it is infected, is rotting. In the current context, uh, in, in the views of like counter uncertainty in the current context, the part that is rotting is Islamist, French Muslims, what are called Islamist, French Muslims, uh, Islam. The guerrilla and the insurgents are a cancer, I meaning Muslims, etc., are a cancer. And the population is gangrenated, meaning that, like, you know, the population start to be uh, affected by this minority that is problematic, either because, like, you know, Muslims, quote unquote, radicalized, this word doesn't mean anything but quote unquote, radicalized, uh, uh, or uh, because, like, you know, um, non Muslim defend Muslims. And so they're called, like, you know, Islamo leftist, etc. I'll get back to that later. Um, and so the state, the military, the police is a physician and has to act to stop that gangrenation, to stop like that cancer. Here we can see a clear link with separatism. Separatism is, as I said at the beginning, the will for a community to create a, 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 a state within the state or to separate from uh, the state, to create their own like, you know, um, sort of like, you know, uh, directing body in a, in, a, in a smaller or larger uh, area. Um, here, when we think about counterinsurgency, it's the same thing. There is a small part of the population that want to separate, that is like, you know, infected, et cetera, and that is endangering the body of the nation. The, the link is really clear with separatism, and I'm not the only one to uh, make the link. So now, how does the state act to stop the disease from spreading? The disease, like, really, that is defined as, like, you know, uh, in the current context, in my opinion, as Islam and Muslims. Uh, the first thing that the state does is prevention. I think it prevents, like, you know, through, like, you know, policies, uh, people to join the rebel minority, people to become Muslim or people to support Muslims. Uh, and they also use fear. Fear is a mechanism that is used by counterinsurgency. And fear is used in the way that, like, you know, uh, as speakers said before me, if you associate yourself with Muslim, if you defend Muslim, uh, Muslims, if you convert to Islam, if you question uh, uh, the, the republic and the, the way the republic is targeting Muslims and, uh, uh, and Islam, you are going to be um, um, defined as an enemy of the Republic. And your life is gonna become like, you know, more difficult. You could like, you know, face uh, uh, actual like, you know, ar ar arrest and stuff like that, et cetera, et cetera. And so fear plays a role in prevention. And then the, the other tactic that counterinsurgency use is surgery. Surgery is like eliminating the menace, meaning uh, literally in the colonies, killing people who were uh, robots or putting them uh, in, in jail for uh, ever. So um, there is some anecdotal indication that shows that separatism and counterinsurgency in the way they fought have been linked together for a longer time. If you look at the, 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 some reports that have been produced by the Brookings institutions, especially reports on uh, terrorism in the Philippines, you will see a clear link there between separatism and counterinsurgency. To fight separatism, the first tool should be counterinsurgency. I'm just like, you know, summarizing all these reports. It's like 100 and 100 of pages, but uh, uh, that's the main idea that you get from the reports, in my opinion. There's also like, you know, uh, um, uh, anecdotal evidence that comes from France and from people who are close to uh, French, the, the power in France. If you take the, the work of Akim El Karawi, uh, Akim El Karawi is a a native informant, a native orientalist. Uh, he has been like, you know, working with Macron to organize in a really colonial way, uh, French Islam. Um, um, and, and that project has been countered by an organization that is called Les Musulmans, L-E-S Les, Mus L -E -S, Les Um In his book, his last book, which is called Islam, a French religion, uh, Islam in religion française, he talks about the need to put in place a cultural counterinsurgency to fight radical Islamism. And so that idea of counterinsurgency to fight Islamism and Islamism or Islam that wants to separate itself from the state is not something that, you know, I'm just seeing from a theoretical point of view. It's something that seemed to have been like, you know, discussed um, uh, within circle of powers. 
of power. So if separatism calls for counterinsurgency, there is a simple question to ask. Is there an Islamist, not an Islamic, because that's apparently we can't say that, an Islamist separatism in France? Uh, from what I see, I can't really say that. And from the conversation that I have with uh, activists and with uh, intellectuals, I can't really say that. And most, most uh, researchers actually agree. Uh, what we see is for French Muslim, uh, within French Muslim is the will to actually assimilate and to integrate as long as they are treated like everybody else. Uh, we like that or not, that's the way like, you know, uh, most of French Muslims seems to be. An anecdotal like, you know, uh, uh, evidence of, of that is the way in which um, that uh, protest that were organized last year against Islamophobia, Muslims that were in the street were chanting La Marseillaise, the French anthem. Uh, we're chanting like a song that, that went laicite, laicite, secularism, secularism, we love you, protect us. So that's not like, you know, a song that you sing if you're trying to separate from friends. That's a song that like, you know, express your love uh, from friends. Uh, a less anecdotal, uh, anecdotal, like, you know, evidence is the work of Francesco Ragazzi, Stefan David Zoffer, Sarah Perry, and Amal Tofwick. Um, a report that was looking at the way, uh, I think it was, the research was done in 2017, so after the 2015 attack in the state of emergency, but uh, it was looking at the way French Muslim trusted or not their institutions. And the report showed that uh, Muslim uh, trusted uh, their institutions um, as much and sometimes even more as every other group. So Muslims are not like, you know, questioning the Republic really strongly in France, or at least they were not. Maybe now they are because like, you know, there's a frontal assault, assault of Muslims by the, the Republic. But uh, what research and anecdotal evidence show is that there is no separatism. So why do we talk about separatism? Because it opens the door to counterinsurgency. And why opening the door for counterinsurgency? Why using like a military tactic in a country that is not at war? Because as Bernard Harcourt, uh, professor at Columbia, uh, explains in his book, The Counter Revolution, designating an insurgent where there is none allows counterinsurgency without an insurgency. And counterinsurgency is perceived by world leaders in a world that is more and more like, you know, challenging them as an efficient way to govern as an efficient form of governance through control. Um, concretely, do I still have some time? Two minutes, okay. Concretely, we talked about the way like, you know, counterinsurgency like, you know, works in France. Uh, the, 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 the law for global security that, uh, as you've talked about a second ago, uh, expands surveillance and at the same time, like, you know, lower descent. Uh, psychological warfare has been going on with like, you know, that accusation of Islamo leftist that is like, you know, um, um, uh, uh, directed toward anyone who defend like, you know, Muslims and Islam against Islamophobia. The whole like, you know, sequence that surrounded Samuel Paty's uh, uh, death uh, assassination uh, is an example of like, you know, propaganda against Muslims and against like whoever wants to defend Muslims. Uh, the exception that is like, you know, a, a main component of counterinsurgency, create an exception for particular people, is expressed through like, you know, uh, laws that Asif talked about, uh, the, the, the law that implemented counterinsurgency, uh, um, the state of emergency within like, you know, common law, um, as well as like, you know, the new uh, law uh, uh, for uh, against separatism or whatever. Uh, and like, you know, the, 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 the way in which like organization, the CCIF and Baraka City have been dismantled in France. So counterinsurgency right now is allowing for the pacification of society in its entirety, but particularly crackdown on Muslim. Um, and the, the question that remains, and I will end on, uh, on that, I have more to say, but I will end on that. The, the, the question that remains is why Muslims in particular, why the French state is attacking Muslim in particular through counterinsurgency or using Muslims to implement counterinsurgency. Well, uh, one element of, uh, like one element that could allow us to answer is that within the work of Tranqui and Galula, those who like, you know, define and reify like counterinsurgency, you can find traces, clear traces of Islamophobia. The way they talked of Muslim, uh, about Muslims and Muslim Algerians in their work is really condescending to, see the, to say the less and profoundly uh, uh, racist. So like, you know, there is an element of explanation here. It's like, you know, the colonial continuum. Um, that is really familiar to those who are uh, here, I figure. Um, it could also like, you know, be the fact that the Muslim became, uh, came to Ambodai the figure of the terrorism 
And that as Guy Debord was saying in his, uh, you know, uh, post face to the uh, Society of the Spectacle, uh, terrorism is going to become, and has become, in my opinion, uh, the main uh, thing toward which society can be controlled. And like, you know, new laws can be imposed. It's the ultimate form of spectacle that can like, you know, always at the same time, like divert people from real issues. And at the same time, allow for the state to reinforce its power. Um, and so uh, in, in that case, like, you know, Islam will just be like a scapegoat. But I, I don't think that Islam is got, uh, just a scapegoat. And I, and I don't think it's just the fact that colonial Islamophobia is transmitted through counterinsurgency doctrine. Um, I think, and Hamza is gonna talk now, and that's something that he told me about, and I thought it was really like, you know, interesting the way he put it. Um, and maybe he's gonna correct me because maybe he didn't say that and I didn't understood him. But uh, he told me that like, you know, the, the issue with um, Islam in France, uh, or the issue that French power, the Republic, the modern state has with Islam in France is that it's seen as a thing, a form of life that gives an alternative to the modern state. Uh, and so it's seen as a threat by the modern state, a threat that has to be uh, annihilated or contained. And, and that goes um, uh, well, I think, with what, uh, what Halak say into the um, uh, impossible states, that uh, simply like, you know, a Muslim modern state can't exist because the deal that Muslims are given by Islam, the liberties that like, you know, Muslims are given by Islam, surpass the ones that are given, and the justice also surpass the ones that are given by the modern state. And so in that configuration, Islam is seen by the modern state as a competitor. And so counterinsurgency is used by the modern state to suppress Islam and suppress like those who embody, uh, embody it, uh, Muslims. Of course, these explanations are, are not exclusive to one another. Again, sorry for taking a bit more time. Uh, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Ibrahim. We have we had a little more time on this panel, so it's good, and we'll take up some of the uh, um, some of the important points you made. Just just in brief, uh, you know, I was I was thinking about, um, I mean, the important points you make around, you know, the the, the medical, of course, the medical metaphor, right? Uh, this is a um, um, interesting, important way to look at it, but uh, and 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 what you outline in terms of um, prevention and then fear and then surgery um, and and the link that you're making between uh, separatism and and counterinsurgency, right? So um, that in in some ways th uh, through Muslims um, you can you can uh, implement a counterinsurgency strategy, which is you know usually in a kind of war strategy, uh, but you can do it. And then the kind of way you uh, ended and maybe Hamza will pick up on this in his presentation as well. Um, but, it, but that it's a, it, it's a kind of, it's a way of life that either must be contained or annihilated, right? So this is kind of, this is uh, where it leads. Um, and I, I'll be interested to hear in the Q&A again, uh, the kind of specific like legal um, mechanisms this, this uses, you know? Uh, and the language that's deployed, uh, because even if you use, as Asif said, like a general language that seems objective, it seems to be specifically targeting Muslims, right? So you can say something about the dissimulation of a face, but we know it's the burqa uh, law. So uh, this, this is a kind of um, important uh, point that you make about discourse itself, right? The language we use um, and, 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 and the connections it makes to law. So thank you for your for your important points. Um, and uh, let me introduce uh, Hamza. Uh, good to see you again as well. Uh, and um, he's a PhD candidate in uh, sociology uh, at uh, L'Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales and in, in Paris. And he was also a visiting scholar uh, when I got to see him a little more uh, at UC Berkeley in the Department of Anthropology 2018-2019. Uh, uh, he'll speak today about from radicalization, a brief history of France's contemporary politics towards Muslims. Welcome, Hamza. Thank you very much, Dr. Munir. Thank you very much uh, uh, for introducing me. Thank you, Dr. Hatton, for organizing this. It's very good to see you, even in this uh, yeah, virtual circumstances, but it's very good to see you. Um, I would like to, uh, yes, uh, speak about some uh, think about Islamophobic policies. And um, I would like to emphasize on uh, both terms. Uh, I think it, it will be um, easier for me to uh, introduce what I want to say by saying that uh, 
the uh, law against separatism, the so-called separatism, and the, what was before that, the fight against so-called radicalization in France, uh, are policies, which means that they are meant to govern, to govern not only Muslims, but the whole society. So I would like to start from this. And also, I would like to, um, I, I didn't, uh, um, I, I wasn't planning on saying that, but uh, uh, since I have, uh, and, uh, I have, um, listened and uh, very much enjoyed the presentations that were uh, um, uh, made before, uh, especially from uh, from the first panel. Um, I would like to try <laughs> a hypothesis with you, uh, which is that uh, um, the developments we can see on uh, France's uh, Islamophobic policies, uh, it has nothing to do uh, either with contextual elements, um, meaning the, uh, the health crisis or the economical crisis and so on, neither with the elections. This is <laughs> what I want to, um, let's say, uh, test with you. Uh, I would like to say that uh, the Islamophobic policies we are witnessing today in France and it, their, their developments, um, they are very much at the core at, of uh, um, France, not only France, but uh, as a matter of fact of, uh, um, let's say, uh, political modernity and uh, and also the way of government in uh, this political uh, modernity. So this is my starting point. <laughs> so again, I I, I I obviously I agree with the importance of context. But for this presentation, I would like to do as if there is nothing, no such thing as context, as there is no such thing as economy or uh, or even elections. This is just something that is linked to politics and uh, modern politics and how modern politics deal with the. Um, with communities, as a matter of fact. So um, I was saying that I want to emphasize on both Islamophobia, on both term Islamophobia and uh, policies. It's because in France, as uh, some uh, panelists mentioned earlier, is uh, it's very common even in the left to say that. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> sorry, I, there will be a lot of coughing, sorry. <laughs> but um, um, uh, it's very common in the left to say that, for instance, that uh, um, yeah, Muslims are the first, but uh, after that you can have uh, ecologists or, I don't know, or uh, leftists or, or other communities and so on. Um, obviously, uh, what I want to, or, or the, other, um, the other thing, which was what uh, Ibrahim said a little earlier, is that uh, Muslims are the scapegoats for, you know, social crisis and uh, and um, uh, and general anger in the society um, I would like to also maybe um, try to say something else which is which is that uh, the Islamophobic policies are um, a goal by themselves uh, which is that uh, through Islamophobia and to Islamophobia policies the French government is government governing the whole society uh, it's uh, uh, establishing symbolic borders it's uh, reaffirming why is to be French? Why is to be a national citizen? Why is to be as, as many? And I think uh, maybe Nadia um, Fadil will say it uh, uh, later on her uh, um, on her presentation. It uh, has reframed the uh, the ideas of her. Um, the, what is to be French in another way. So this is what I mean with the idea that uh, Islamophobic policies, um, they are meant to govern the whole society and now and not in uh, some, uh, I don't know, some near future. So just to begin, uh, I would like to present some uh, few uh, points about uh, yeah, the development of these policies. It has all started with the, at least in the last few years, since uh, let's say 2014, it has started with the, a very new term in the French debate and the, in its policies, which is radicalization. Uh, radicalization was uh, uh, the way uh, French state and French ideologists and the uh, French debate um, um, labelized the, uh, the emergence of the violence, violence in, but also it hasn't begun with the, with the, the 2015 attacks. It's uh, actually it's begun a year earlier, but say, uh, still, sorry, still um, the, uh, uh, the idea of radicalization uh, and the different dispositives and the mechanisms, institutional mechanisms that were implemented in, um, in the, the, the French society um, tended to colonize all the uh, state, govern uh, state institutions. Uh, for instance, in, in schools, you have someone who is uh, in charge of uh, tackling radicalization in hospitals, in administrations, in, uh, in, uh, in companies, in, uh, in universities, and so on. So this discourse on radicalization, it has truly succeeded in uh, tackling uh, um, yeah, Yes, 
all um, all society, all uh, what's this, and the, it has a very uh, quantitative uh, <laughs> um, uh, results. Uh, as of uh, 2017, there were more, more than fifty-seven thousand reports on radicalization, uh, meaning that uh, um, yes, fifty-seven thousand people. Uh, Call the government saying that my neighbor is radicalized, or my friend is radicalized, or my husband or my wife is radicalized, and so on. So this is the, the very effect of uh, this colonization of the state and the society of uh, by this discourse on radicalization. It has uh, again, it has colonized all, even uh, the uh, let's say the left part of the state. You know, for Bourdieu, there are the right part, which is. Uh, police and the uh, army and so on. And there is the left part of the state, which is education. So it was a very strong uh, um, tool for the French state to, yes, to tackle so-called radicalization. And this is maybe also a difference between the uh, French politics uh, Towards radicalization, then uh, regarding the uh, I don't know the American ones or the uh, British ones or the uh, also the uh, uh, the Norwegian ones and so on. It's that uh, for uh, for the French politics, uh, radicalization was very linked to the uh, uh, impoverished neighborhoods where where most of uh, immig immigration lives. So uh, um, social work in this aspect was uh, meant to uh, you know be the ones that. Since they are um, also from this uh, impoverished neighborhood, the social workers, they're the ones who can actually go there and uh, witness for themselves the so-called radicalization. So this is the uh, my first point, is that uh, this is how, uh, for the last few years, um, France intended to uh, fight against the so-called radicalization. It has also led to uh, um, a very specific development of knowledge um, this is one of the main aspects of this uh, discourse on radicalization. It, it is that uh, it is very linked to a certain kind of sociology and uh, more generally on social sciences within the French academia that uh, were all dedicated to, you know, um, discuss the right signs of radicalization, whether you have a beard, if, if and when a beard is a threat uh, for the French society and uh, is a sign of uh, um, uh, radicalization. There might be a connection issue with Hamza. We lost you for a second. Give him a few, few minutes until he, he comes back. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear? Yes, okay. Thank you. So, sorry, um, I apologize for <laughs> for this. I have some uh, troubles with my uh, uh, yes, my, my connection. Sorry. Um, so I was saying that uh, um, this uh, emergence of uh, the radicalization discourse has uh, been parallel to uh, the emergence of a very specific knowledge, uh, which has all which was was all dedicated to uh, you know um, be the more efficient in uh, uh, localizing and uh, neutralizing. Uh, the so-called radicalization. So this is the uh, one also one of the very specific um, uh, aspects of the uh, French uh, dealing um, with the so-called radicalization. It's, it, is, it is very linked to social sciences and the French academia. But uh, this is my, so I think a very important point to understand the difference between the fight against radicalization, this discourse and um, the following discourse on separatism is that although um, it has targeted a very large number of Muslims and mosques and uh, Muslim organizations and so on. It, ha it was still um, uh, parallel to this, uh, you know, this very famous uh, quote of uh, François Hollande, the former president and, uh, and many uh, uh, French uh, officials, which is pas d'amalgame, no mixing. You don't have to, you should not mix between the, uh, you know, the few bad uh, apples and uh, the majority which is fine. Of course, the few bad apples uh, from the point of view of uh, the French states may be actually more Muslim community. I mean, that's, it has uh, um, this discourse on radicalization, it has affected all Muslim community, but still as a discourse, um, as, a, as a figure of speech, <laughs> uh, the French officials uh, were saying that, you know, uh, it's, we are not um, uh, targeting the whole Muslim community. So this is, I think, a very important point because what's 
what is coming next that so which is what we are witnessing uh, since the last few months and this is very important to say is that the french state uh, for the first time is saying no we are in fact uh, uh, targeting the muslim community and not about these issues of violence this is a very important thing we are not targeting the muslim communities because uh, um it is uh, supposed to, you know, hell violence. It is because, as many of my uh, co-panelists said, um, it is because they are separatists. And this is a very important thing. This is, uh, to my knowledge, this is the very first time that the French state, for the last few decades, has targeted, uh, namely, a, a community, a community by its name. And so now you have, uh, in, the, for instance, in the, I don't know, the uh, prefecture, which is uh, the French equivalent for, I don't know, the region, maybe, in, uh, in the UK or something. Or the province, maybe you have a specific part of the administration which is dedicated to fight against Islamism. Of course, it doesn't say Islam, but just the fact that we are saying Islam, it's a very, very, very big um, upheaval in the French politics and in the uh, um, the way that French states uh, tackles uh, Muslim community. So this is, I think, very important. But yet. I think that uh, the use of uh, the term separatism, as uh, uh, Ibrahim said earlier, it's kind of um, it's it may uh, um, be a kind of a, um, I don't know a, a problem for us to understand because actually uh, it has also this uh, this new politics against separatism. It has also its own knowledge, which is very different of the uh, from the knowledge we uh, were speaking earlier about uh, about radicalization. Uh, which was very linked to the social sciences. Now it's something completely different. It has other ideologies which are um, targeting Islam as a whole, as a whole, as a, a global whole. This is the, you know, the uh, um, the very now the very famous phrase of uh, expression of uh, Macron saying that uh, uh, Islam is. Uh, uh, now uh, in the whole world in crisis. So uh, it's really the idea that Islam is a whole and it should be targeted as a whole. So this is a, a very um, few ideologists, uh, some of which uh, were part of the, uh, the, um, the open uh, tribune that was uh, referred to earlier, the 100 academics against Islamism. Some of them were uh, these uh, ideologists very close to the state and uh, um, yeah, pushing from, for, 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 for this definition of uh, Islam as a whole, that is a, whole, a problem for everyone, everywhere, um, and which is at the core of the separatism politics. But yet, I think this is, will be this will be maybe uh, my final points. I think that uh, this uh, uh, <laughs> this idea of separatism is not about people effective, effectively uh, separating themselves from France. Is that is the problem? Is that now Muslims in France are everywhere? This is the problem. I think uh, for because in the same time the French official are saying that you know Muslims are trying to separate but in the same time they are saying that that Muslims is, are, are trying to enter every sphere of society such as universities such as uh, hospitals such as uh, I don't know the uh, um, bar such as um, uh, companies and so on so this is the very important thing this is the idea that the enemy is amongst us and I think this this very point maybe it could help us uh, help us understand more um, for instance, the uh, the very um, strange to my to me uh, uh, focusing on the Muslim Brotherhood. So, uh, if you if you pay attention to the French uh, discourse, the French officials' discourse, it has moved from uh, um, yes, very, being very being very critical uh, to Salafism, uh, viewed as a, you know a very uh, extreme practice of Islam and so on. Of course, I'm I'm, I'm using the terms of the uh, French officials to the Muslim Brotherhood. Because as François Burga said earlier, the problem now, now is not the Muslim that has a beard, it's the Muslim that has no beard. It's the Muslim that cannot be recognized from another. This is from a non-Muslim. This is the problem of uh, now separatism is that Muslims have, uh, uh, have so integrated in the society without assimilating, uh, being assimilated, within, I mean, we, uh, while say, saying Muslims, uh, that um, it is a problem. And I think just for, um, Understanding this a little, little further, I think we should understand um, what is to be uh, uh, actually a Muslim in France. And uh, I think this is uh, very linked to, uh, uh, maybe I will end on this, on the Islamic revival. Uh, 
um, the forms of which, and this is why Ibrahim was, was speaking about the form of life, the, 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 form, the Muslim form of life that has been uh, established in France uh, from the last few decades is very different from the, uh, um, the, 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 the first uh, immigrants uh, Muslim practice uh, when they arrived in France. Uh, now, uh, Muslims have uh, uh, succeeded in uh, building many mosques in France. In, uh, uh, now they have also succeeded in thinking that uh, their Muslimness is not linked to their origins. Uh, um, I mean, that uh, for, for thinking of yourself as a Muslim, you don't have to turn to Morocco, to Algeria, or to Tunisia, I mean, the, um, the main countries from which uh, immigrants were from, and so on. So this is, I think, the very important thing is that, uh, weirdly, but still, um, the Islamic revival, revival in France is a sign of integration, in integration in France. And uh, I mean, not in a political way, because obviously uh, politics is very, uh, very uh, anti-Muslim, obviously, but still in a sociological way, uh, the fact that Muslims are, not, uh, are now seeing themselves as Muslims and not only as Algerians or Moroccans or from Algerian descent or so on, is a sign of integration in France. And I think this is, uh, for, I'm referring to the, uh, um, to, 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 to something uh, Horia, my, my dear friend Horia said earlier, um, that Muslim is, uh, Islamophobia is kind of a rebranding of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, anti-Arab um, racism. I, I, I would like to uh, uh, respectfully disagree with this idea. I think that Islamophobia has actually nothing to do with the anti-Arab uh, racism as we are, uh, we experimented it for uh, many decades in France and we are still experimenting it uh, now. But Islamophobia is something else. It's the problem that the enemy is not at our border, it's, they are amongst us. It's the idea that the enemy is not the barbaric uh, country or even the barbaric people that are living within our countries. It's the idea that the, 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 the enemy is like us. And this is the problem, I think, is the, that this is the fact that means, makes, I think, uh, uh, Islamophobia way more uh, comparable to, uh, to anti-Semitism than to uh, colonial racism. Um, also, I'm sorry, but uh, I feel the urge of saying this uh, as a, uh, Muslim uh, living in France, and also as a yes, someone uh, who were, was part of the CCIA, for instance, uh, I heard Ramon saying that uh, anti-Semitism is uh, um, um, a minor fact uh, now in France. I also would like to disagree with this idea. Uh, it, it is not true. I think it's absolutely not true. Uh, yes, this is a side <laughs> that has nothing to do with the rest of uh, what I was saying, but I think it's very important to understand that uh, we are what we are saying now, uh, in, in what we are witnessing now in France, uh, is nothing else that a very nationalistic turn of events that uh, uh, is very much uh, targeted against uh, uh, Muslims clearly, and uh, it is being said by the French officials themselves. This idea of separatism is uh, again is uh, very much targeted against Muslims, and uh, again the fact that Muslims are now part of the French society. This is a very problem of the separatism discourse. Uh, but yet, I think that uh, we, have, we are witnessing uh, in the most uh, parts of the world this uh, very nationalistic turn of, of events, which is also, unfortunately, uh, linked to anti-Semitism, to rise of anti-Semitism. So uh, I think I will stop here. I had many things. Uh, uh, yes, maybe just another uh, last thing is that uh, something very strange for us uh, uh, working on Islamophobia in France is that, uh, actually it's not strange at all, but still, it's, I think it's, uh, it's uh, notable, is that, uh, of course, the, uh, um, the very Islamophobic turn of events now in France is uh, very linked and uh, very uh, um, supported by uh, some, friends, some Muslim majority countries such as the United Arab Emirates, such as Egypt, such as uh, uh, of course Saudi Arabia, and so on. And uh, it's very interesting for us because uh, what's uh, France proposing, uh, suggesting as a way to, you know, counter separatism is to come back to the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the control of uh, these countries, uh, also Morocco, also Algeria, also Tunisia, over their nationals, their so-called nationals in France. So they are trying to actually deintegrate so the, the Muslims from the French society and saying to the, to the Muslims, you are first Moroccans, you are first Tunisian, or, or your, your understanding of Muslim, of what it what is to be Muslim and what is Islam should be first and foremost uh, um, 
um, stated by Saudi Arabia or United Arab Emirates and so on. So I think this is a very important thing is that the actual answer of France to the, uh, the very common and very important, uh, um, yes, uh, development of Islam in France uh, uh, is, is to come back to the earlier situation. So I think I will end here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I hope it's as, uh, still a little clear. <laughs> Thank you, Hamza, for your presentation. Um, we'll pick up on some of some of the uh, uh, the points that you made, um, and and especially the, you know the the again the the separatism laws is of course uh, you know you're you're trying to make the argument of this is not just governing Muslims but all of society, but of course it's done through uh, through Muslims, and and your your idea that you're trying to you know develop in terms of how how to think of this as a kind of modern politics without context, like, so without, you, you're trying to see how that would play out. So, you know, I would welcome any, uh, any thoughts that people have um, uh, on this. And, and, you know, some of the contradictions we're seeing, uh, you mentioned uh, Francois Hollande, uh, his, uh, oh, uh, I think you said, uh, uh, de Malgum, right, not, not mixing. On the other hand, uh, there's this effort to, to mix and assimilate. So there's a kind of strange, Mm, contradiction to read out, and on the other hand, um, the signs that we look for uh, of, of of radicalization, and at the same time, uh, this whole move to saying they're just like us, right? I remember, uh, I don't know who it was, maybe I, I'm not sure if it was on this uh, any of us, uh, but um, or or some of our other colleagues, but a few years ago we had you know the stop uh, jihadism poster that had come out from the French government, right, on radi uh, uh, radicalization, the premier scene keep of alerte, and it was things like, uh, um, uh, you know, it, it was, it was uh, crazy things about not their habitude alimentaire, about their food habits, they changed their, il arrête député de la musique, they stopped, you know, doing sports events, they stopped music, they, change leur tenue monter, their, their clothing habits and cooling. And so this is a kind of interesting thing about the signs. And the, these were actually put out by the French government. And I, I wonder over these years how, how this kind of posters, uh, as ridiculous as they are, uh, how, they, how they change, you know, uh, and how they create uh, certain ways in which a public is made aware of, of, of what constitutes um, uh, radicalization and it links to you know the question uh, that um, you know that one of I'll just go to the Q&A and of course uh, we have some of these questions and I'd like to even begin by seeing if any of you have questions for each other including uh, Dr. Salman, Dr. Fadil, every, Dr. Farid, any of you you're welcome anyone who wants to chime in maybe with questions to each other and then we have some some questions in the Q&A as well that um, uh, radicalization and the laws, the laws around that. So, do any of you want to just begin with questions to each other? Um, I was just going to say that the infographics that you just like you know talked about is uh, indeed interesting and funny. So I posted a link to it um, on the chat. If anyone, any of the attendees want to go and check it out, um, it's an interesting document. There were some um, there were some questions in the Q and A, and let's uh, there's someone on the panel here that has questions for each other. Okay, ask if there's a couple of questions. Maybe you want to start with them, and anyone else who wants to uh, to chime in. But um, uh, you mentioned the question from Lindsay is uh, actually I think there was one earlier than that from. Uh, uh, yeah, from Lara and Lindsay, maybe you want to take them both. Uh, this question is for Asif. I'm an American French lawyer. I'm shocked by the laws are passed without constitutional challenge just because of some linguistic modification. In the US, it's neutral on its face, but has disproportionately negative impact on a protected class, then it will be engage in a similar analysis. It shouldn't be this easy to pass this legislation when the targets are obviously Muslim. Then Lindsay, 
or you know, it's different, but you know, you might want to take in both uh, the, the laws against radicalization and how much of we, how much of what we're seeing today, you think, stems from the legitimization of the United States a month of war on terror, and I think this is an important comparison. Um, so, significant marking points of terms like terrorists and radicalization become much more weaponized and, in a sense, legitimate. Well, thank you, Munir. Uh, I will just take the first question about uh, the uh, scrutiny that apply to the constitutional test for laws. So basically, uh, uh, our friend is referring to the type of uh, tests that are being used by uh, U.S. that is being used by U.S. Supreme Court today. Uh, in constitutional law, which are in the number of three, there is strict scrutiny, intermediate, and um, rational basis scrutiny. And when it's related with religion, it's always you have to pass the uh, the, the test of the strict scrutiny, which is, uh, uh, if my memory is correct, is uh, it, it, you need to achieve a compelling government interest, and it needs to be narrowly defined, the limitation on, on, on the constitutional freedom. Well, in France, it's a little bit different. In France, the government can always adopt a piece of legislation unless it's prima facie unconstitutional. Like when I talk about these retention centers uh, um, for radicalized Muslim, I mentioned the fact that it went all the way through this constitutional constitutional state street because when the parliamentary do the fil parliamentary workers do the filter, uh, when you propose the law, it passes through a filter, a parliamentary filter. If the parliament filter uh, decide unanimously that it's unconstitutional, you have to send this bill to the constitutional council, and the constitutional council has to declare it admissible or not admissible for the debates. And most of the time when the um, uh, parliamentary workers send that bill to the Constitutional Council, it's often overturned and the bill is being canceled. The proposed bill is being canceled. Uh, but there is two type of control that is exercised in France on a, um, on a law. Uh, the first one is, um, and, and I will give you an example, a practical example that I tried, but it didn't went through because uh, well, I will explain it. So the, the first element is when um, a, a 60 member of parliament decide to go through to, to the, Consti uh, the uh, Constitutional Council and decide to submit that law to the appreciation of the Constitutional Council. And we hope that uh, France Insoumise, uh, uh, member of parliament, alongside with other parliament will submit this law on separatism when it will be promulgated or the law on global security to the constitutional council. Uh, but if they do not, you have the possibility to raise the question of constitutionality by exception while you're doing a litigation in front of administrative court. So that happened to me once. I don't know if you remember the case when uh, 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 a, a young lady named Sarah was being um, expelled from her school because she was wearing a long skirt. It was the case of the long skirt. I think it was a little bit before 2015 even. And uh, they decided that this long skirt is a ostentious uh, a piece of clothing and it represents somehow uh, some orthodox um, uh, Muslim branch. And then therefore it should not be allowed in our school. So what we decided to do with Sarah uh, in the beginning when she decided to litigate the case because she decided in the first place to do so, uh, we decided to raise a question of constitutionality which will be based on what is a ostentious sign because the law needs to be clear and if it's not clear, it's deemed unconstitutional. And we couldn't do it at the end, but the, because of many, many pressure that she received uh, and all that, because you need to understand that Islamophobia is entertained by media. Uh, and when a person is victim of Islamophobic uh, remarks or whatever, it becomes, when it becomes a national polemics, media come around your home, they start staying around your home, they start asking you questions, you cannot go out peacefully, and that pushes people to withdraw for any legal uh, from any litigation. And this is why CCIF was fundamental because CCI, with the CCIF, 
all these pers uh, all these litigation become unpersonalized. These uh, phys uh, physical person were giving to a uh, institutionalized association the possibility to litigate the case or not, and they were feeling comfortable with that, with that type of structure. That being said, that you can raise this question by exception, and the exception goes through two filters, Supreme Court filter and the and then after the Constitutional Council. So it's really complicated uh, today to challenge for a citizen to challenge directly the constitutionality of a law because it will pass through a very long litigation and very long struggle. Whereas in America, I don't know the actual proceeding, but if the law is unconstitutional, I think the Supreme Court can uh, ha have jurisdiction in order to declare it whether constitutional or not. But that has to be subject to a legal advice from an attorney in America. And the second question, I, I to be honest, I think your mic was cutting, so I didn't get it right. Sorry, it was just it was just um, a question from Lindsay about, um, uh, and anyone can answer this, but uh, it's it was the you mentioned about the law, uh, the attempt to create laws against radicalization, and the question is how much of what we are seeing today do you think stems from the legitimization of the U.S. mantra on the war on terror? So, um, you know, is that a significant marking? Do you think that these terms like terrorist and radicalization uh, becoming much more weaponized in a sense, uh, legitimized for use by governments around the world. Yes, I think you know the problem with the, with these uh, with this notion of radicalization and all that is the the lack of definition, and, and the problem is when uh, you use that as a legislative tool. And I'm not. I'm only talking about law. Is and and if you have a notion that is not really defined. So, for example, about radicalization. I had a case where I was defending some uh, one person who had been house arrest during the state of emergency. He was a convert Muslim for more than 20 years. And he has been uh, litigated by the interior ministry because he was a um, friend with somebody uh, who was a radical or whatever. He went to Syria and all that. So his stand was, I was friend with him, but I didn't knew that he was radicalized or whatever. But the judge, when we present in front of him for a preliminary hearing, he uh, he decided and he he said he said this very straightforward thing to me, and which I found like really strange. But uh, he said that you see, I don't know if this guy is radicalized or not. But what I said to the court is, your work is not to appreciate if he's radicalized or not is to appreciate under the circumstances if this guy is a, is, a, is a terror threat. And if he's not, you have to give him back his freedom because you cannot mandatory keep this person in a housing arrest while he didn't do anything. He said, yeah, but how, sh how should I know that he's not gonna take a Kalashnikov and start firing everywhere in front of that guy? So you see that when the judiciary don't have proper definition of what radicalization is, of what a terror threat is, of what is the different process that will come up to a condemnation by a court of law. This is what, is, this is what happened. It happened that we pick, pick everybody in a sort of bubble and we condemn everybody. And the freedom, uh, it, it, it freedom of movement, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, for some example, Ibrahim mentioned uh, these kids that have been uh, under minor retention. They are eight years old, eight years old, just because they said we're not Charlie or whatever. And these things is happening just based on the lack of definition of these type of notion, radicalization, uh, not talking properly. I don't know. You know, they, 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 every day is a new is a new story in France. You know, they can invent you m multiple things, and, and now they're even. The funniest thing is when the state representative, they start talking about religion. So they become specialists in Takia, they become specialists in, uh, in everything, in Islam, actually. They're, 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 they're going to refaith your own, your own religion, you know? So uh, th th this is the, the, the biggest problem is, yes, we are weaponizing these notions. And yes, we are using them in the judicial battlefield. And this is the problem. And when you use them in a judicial battlefield, 
it's always at the prejudice of Muslim people. If I can add to that, but maybe Hamza want to. Uh, oh, Hamza, you want to go first? No, so, sorry. Uh, go, go, uh, go ahead, Ibrahim. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. <laughs> okay, Mark Lofik. Uh, no, I, I just want to because um, uh, what say the. Um, um, what was said uh, just a little <laughs> seconds ago about uh, yes, I, I think I failed in my presentation to uh, to remember to say how much if, indeed the uh, discourse on radicalization was uh, very strong in the uh, judicial uh, institutions in France, and um, as someone who has uh, witnessed a lot of uh, anti-terrorist uh, uh, process. Um, um, trials, uh, someone asked uh, to what extent it was similar, for instance, to what was uh, uh, implemented in the US uh, within the war on terror. Uh, I, I will let Ibrahim answer that because uh, he's uh, so much more of an expert uh, about uh, what was happening in the US uh, in the war on terror. But it seems to me that um, in the US, I think, was in the US, the, the, the idea, even if it was obviously flawed and obviously uh, um, uh, yes, very targets against Muslim, but still the idea was vaguely to try and prove that someone has a connection with the, uh, a so-called terrorist organization. Uh, in France, it was uh, with the discourse on radicalization, it started to be something completely different. For instance, I remember in a trial um, that uh, some, uh, someone who actually was, uh, um, yes, who was a convert to Islam, and uh, the, uh, the state attorney was saying that um, they have found that uh, this, uh, this young man um, had as a, a password for his phone, his Blackberry, I remember, <laughs> it was Islam. Uh, and I, I, I say that a lot, so I think uh, some of you already heard me saying that, but I, I'm sorry about this. But so this guy has a password, uh, Islam, and, um, and the, the conclusion of the state attorney is to say, um, to say, to see, to say that uh, uh, when we know how much uh, a password pertains to one's uh, uh, personality, uh, it tells us a lot about his own radicalization. And uh, yes, it was a kind of a proof kind of evidence against him that he has as a password Islam. So this is a very, I think, and I'm not a lawyer and I would like to, uh, I, I, of course, can be confirmed or not by the uh, Arif, but um, in these anti-terrorist uh, trials, the, uh, the demonstrating one's radicalization according indeed to a very weak definition of the, the word radicalization, but it was intended that way, um, uh, starts to be the whole point of the whole trial just the, the showing how much one is radicalized and therefore that he should, he should be condemned for that. So this is what I want to add, thank you. Um, if, I, if I can uh, add to that uh, really quickly on the word radicalization uh, and on the concept of radicalization, I think it, it's important to understand that um, yes, the US, the global war on terror led by the US and export <coughs> over country played the role into uh, spreading that discourse but the discourse of radicalization also has been spread uh, from the UK in which that form of counterterrorism per se uh, was seen as like, you know, the, the, the main way or one of the main ways to fight against uh, terrorism. Uh, the United States participated in that and uh, there is like, you know, documents that circulated really widely, one of them being the NYPD radicalization in the West report and participated into the, 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 the misdefinition or uh, over definition or non definition of radicalization, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, but uh, I, I will say that, like, the UK also played a huge role into uh, exporting the word radicalization and ideas about radicalization. Like, two works that I will advise to check on that is the book of Arun Kamdani, The Muslim Are Coming. Uh, it's getting a bit old, but it's still amazing. And uh, a more recent book, I think published just in French, but Nadia Fadil will be able to tell you if there is a um, uh, uh, an English translation coming out. The, the book that she wrote uh, with uh, Francesco Ragazzi about radicalization is also like, you know, a really good compilation of, uh, of what is radicalization, what has been defined as uh, radicalization. So that's that's for uh, uh, this, this thing. Uh, the word terrorism is also important. The word terrorism is also important because uh, the, the word terrorism is also overused and uh, misused uh, really uh, uh, largely. Oh, Dutch. Oh, the book is in English. Okay, all right. Sorry, um, sorry about that. <laughs> but the book is in English, so it's perfect. Um, and what I was going to say, I was going to say, yeah, the the word terrorism, 
the word terrorism is also important uh, in the way in which it has been exported and defined in the sense that uh, it has came to mainly like, you know, define certain form of like, you know, violence. And that doesn't start with 9-11 or with Muslims uh, even. It, it starts with the way in which like, you know, the, the word terror of terrorism uh, uh, as a political like, you know, activity, uh, as it was like, you know, uh, maybe first used most people like trace it back there uh, in the aftermath of the French Revolution during the, the Le Regime de la Terreur, Robespierre. Um, um, is defined now as something that can be used by the states. There is, like, it's uh, it's commonplace to say there is 200 or, or more definitions, official definitions of terrorism uh, over uh, uh, over different institutions, etc., war institutions, American institutions, etc. That's commonplace in the in the uh, field of uh, studies uh, on terrorism. But at the same time, more than that, most definition exclude the state from uh, uh, the the definition of terrorism. The, the most common definition or the most uh, common backbone of the definition that you will find is uh, uh, an act of violence that is uh, used to um, create fear in order to further a political agenda and that is uh, committed by non-state actor. And that takes away from the definition, the possibility that a state actor could engage in like, you know, political violence to further a political agenda. But when you look at the way uh, in which state actors use violence, uh, it's open to further a political agenda, to establish control over their own society, or to further a political agenda overseas, as we saw with the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq among, uh, uh, among others, as we saw with uh, the bombing of Raqqa in, uh, in Syria, uh, for example. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say about that. Thank you, Ibrahim. Um, I just, uh, just to clarify, I know uh, Dr. Nadia, you put it in the chat, uh, just, uh, but the book for those who um, uh, want to know, the title is Radicalization in Belgium and the Netherlands, Critical Perspectives on Violence and Security. That's Dr. Uh, Nadia Fadel's um, edited volume with her colleagues. Um, we'll go to Dr. Salman's uh, question and then there, I'll group some of the questions in the Q&A and just put them out there. Um, uh, so Dr. Salman. Yeah. Thank you very much for this panel. Um, I want to start off with just um, agreeing with um, Hamza, especially in relation to the kind of non-economistic readings of Islamophobia, that in a sense, Islamophobia isn't really about anything except itself in a way of reforming and reformulating the um, different kind of nation states um, in the world right now. And I think it's really, really important that we have that on site rather than seeing it as an excuse for something else. But the question I really want to ask, and it's a more practical one, and, I, and I've been kind of fascinated listening to the kind of various contor uh, quotation, um, contortions and con um, movements around legal frameworks and things like that. And I'm just thinking that one of the issues obviously happens is that when you have a national space which is compromised and which is so um, complicated and so hostile to expressions of Muslimness, then what are the uh, channels or alternatives, both legal and non-legal, for moving towards another, uh, our flanking that for a European framework or even an international framework. There's also a famous example of Malcolm X taking the um, United States or trying to take the United States to the UN security. Um, but I think even within the context of France, it would just be interesting to see whether um, there is any kind of um, pathways to a European resolution or a European in, um, in, um, in outflanking this incredibly horrific uh, legislation. I don't, th I think everyone's very, very clear about what the stakes are. So I just wanted to ask a question about that. Munir, I, I go ahead. Uh, 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 immediately turn to you, but yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so it was basically, yeah, it's a very important and, and very good question. Um, and, and I think, yes, uh, the, the only uh, possibility for now, uh, regarding also the advice of the State Council, uh, the Supreme Administrative Court in France, because they render an advice, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, about the se separatism law. Uh, and uh, they, they mentioned few they, they, they mentioned few reserve of interpretation about the uh, possibility of um, dissolution and of some associations and all that. But regarding, for example, the case of the CCIF or Baraka City or any other association or mosque that will come next further, um, 
because they they decided to crack down on 78 mosques, I, I, I think, and and they all like decided to lock few mosques in order to show that they're doing something, right? And so the the thing is. Uh, France legislation for now, I think it will be really complicated to get a positive decision. Even though when you are in French, in front of French jurisdiction, you should not waive a single argument in front of them. Every single every single court should be um, uh, should be seized in these cases. So if you have an exception of constitutionality, you should raise it. If you should go up to the uh, administrative Supreme Court. And if that does not work, France is signatory of the European Convention of Human Rights that created the European Court of Human Rights. So definitely you can go in front of European Court of Human Rights. And I think there is good grounds uh, there in order to get those decisions, those law uh, canceled. And actually, I think even the government knows it, but he knows that the, 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 the political tempo up to the time that will that these these cases will go up to the European C C Court of Human Rights, all these polemics will be done then, and a lot of uh, um, water will be uh, drawn under the bridge, and everything will be cooled down. So this is what they want. They want that the judiciary tempo to be really long. But I think at the same time there is one other option that uh, now CCIF I think already started, but. Uh, it is the uh, Human Rights Council of the UN. I mean, this the, the Human Rights Council of the UN can be seized by anybody if it's in violation of the international power on civil and political rights. And those freedom, association, religion are contained into this. So you can go ahead and, and, and try to litigate the case in front of them. And I think what we uh, stop doing as well, for example, I think when something like this happened, uh, U.S. has a lot of contribution in it, and recently, the I think is the chief of um, United States Commission on Religious Freedom. He clearly denounced what is happening in France, and I think these are good steps. I think human rights uh, NGOs are good steps, and I think all these leverage should be used by our uh, brothers and sister, whoever he is, has an influential uh, possibility. In, into these organization and that show, we should show the piece of legislation. I mean, the piece of legislation by itself is, is, is very, is, it's a very talkative point. And it's a very good argumentation that there is discrimination going on for more than 10 years now, even more. And I'm talking about 10 years, it's 30, 40 years. So the, the, the way the French legislation is construed, I think you can go in front of international organization, you can go in front of international uh, courts, you can go in front of European courts, and all these leverage shall be used because there is a, a, a um, influence of how internationally we look at France. When, France, uh, when Emmanuel Macron has been criticized in, in, in New York Times or other international media, he reacted. And if he react, that means he is in a position when he had to defend himself because it's going wrong. And I, I think we don't write enough into these uh, uh, international um, uh, medias. Because you, you see, uh, one of the major uh, polemics maker you can say in France is one institution called Printemps Républicain. When those people start, they have a huge media uh, influence. When these people start doing polemics, they just go to their contact and they start spreading the news uh, all, all over in France. But when they're being criticized by international media, they have to, they have the need, and you can you can find on their Twitter account, do not follow them, but you have the possibility to see on the uh, on their Twitter account that they reply. So if they reply, that mean they're in a defensive position. So this is what we need to do. We need, we need to corner these type of ideology in order to put them into a defensive uh, way uh, um, of responding to articles. And I think America can play a big really leading role on this. And, and all the professors here today are, are, that are listening to us and uh, uh, they, they, they should be able I mean, if it's in, the, in their possibility, and I think it's, it, it, they can be neutral, very neutral uh, in their way of speaking about these things. 
and uh, they, they can they can address the concerns. I mean, the law on separatism and the law of security, global security is, it, by itself. You just open the article; it's an open book for a three, four pages article. You know, so uh, uh, I would say uh, these are the two leverage that we need to use: international media and international courts. Yes. Thank you, Asif. Um, I'm going to take. Uh, I'm just going to group the questions in the Q and A, and I'll put them out there. I know some are. Uh, some are directed uh, specifically, but uh, uh, anyone's welcome to respond. So um, there was a uh, question from Yasmin to Hamza, and of course anyone can respond uh, by saying there's a form of integration of minorities in France through the classification Muslims and not a race. Do you think somehow there's a volunteer, uh, somehow there's a will from the government to make French Islam? or that this is a progressive integration of minorities into French society globally. Um, there's another question. Um, I agree with Ibrahim, <coughs> the tactics are being used on the people now, but why uh, have the colonialists run out of other countries to use them on, uh, new enemies to target, or is there another uh, better way to profit to make, uh, made from citizens um, uh, than the other countries? Uh, there's another question. Um, how to understand and react to Islamophobia and racism coming from sons and daughters of immigrants who succeeded in the secular French society. Uh, you know, these are probably what we call the native informants sometimes. Uh, As a French Muslim woman of North African descent, I find it particularly disturbing and hard to fight. I know that this is a phenomenon uh, It was described by Franz Fanon, uh, but maybe it's a different context as today. And then there's... Uh, Again, I'll just put all these questions out. Uh, Hamza has mentioned that the uh, deintegration of Muslims in France by suggesting their origins, uh, i.e. ethnicity in their identity as opposed to being French. Hence, they need to return to Morocco, Algeria, for example. Is this Islamophobic rhetoric or is this a real threat to French Muslims in terms of losing their French citizenship? Or is this more a form of alienation and othering so that Muslims will leave? This whole notion is quite scary since any social group can call victim, can fall victim to losing their national citizenship. And then you're uh, getting uh, Hamza some encouragement to, uh, I guess, to develop, uh, develop the idea of Islamophobia is not a new um, anti-Arab racism, uh, or can you develop it? Uh, so I'll put those questions out there and um, in the we have about 10, 12 minutes. So if we can uh, respond to those. Um, okay, uh, if I may, maybe just, um, I, I won't be able to answer all of it, but just um, what I have heard uh, about French Islam. Uh, no, I was not referring to uh, this uh, very old and very, um, as a matter of fact, ineffective uh, attempts to, uh, um, from the French state to organize French Islam. Even if um, I think we should, for instance, think more seriously about what uh, an institution as uh, such as the CFCM, the Conseil Français du Compte Musulman, which was, of course, which was uh, founded by Nicolas Sarkozy, which was uh, at the time the Minister of Interior. But at the time, for instance, the Conseil Français du Compte Musulman was uh, mainly representing the generation of uh, uh, immigrant workers that came to France, and as a matter of fact, those those who built. The mosque. So it's a bit um, difficult to under, you know, I, I, I agree with the, the idea of native informants, but I, there are also some negotiations. It's, it's not so, um, sometimes it can be a little complex. Even if, for instance, the CFCM now is completely endorsing the um, separatism speech, but still um, they mean something in the, in the community. So I think we should. Uh, tackle all of it uh, all together. But I was not referring to French Islam. I was just referring to a very common sociological <laughs> phenomenon is that uh, these people, um, the, 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 um, the immigrants and their sons, the ones who have uh, um, become Muslims, again, I'm very much attached to the idea of the Islamic revival. Um, uh, they are not uh, experiencing their faith or their piety uh, 
uh, as uh, um, something that's immediately attached to uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and so on. So this is what I'm saying. It's that uh, they are experiencing the parity and they are not only experiencing it, but also thinking about the way to move it to the uh, uh, actual world, for instance, to, I don't know, to build mosques, to, uh, to build mosques, to, uh, to work with the community, to, um, um, to um, establish charities such as Baraka City or a thousand other charities that are established by Muslims in France and so on, the sky, or, or even politics or even the various forms of uh, um, expressing and uh, living and understanding piety is in France is no longer linked to my understanding to the uh, fact these people are foreigners at all. This is not the, uh, I think this is, this should be understand, understood. And this is why, uh, this may be uh, what was asking uh, Elias, what's, what's the difference between uh, the Arab racism, the racism towards Arabs in France and towards immigrants and the, the Islamophobia is that again, um, <laughs> it reminds me as a matter of fact of uh, um, a dis uh, yes, a discussion I had with the executive the, the director of the, uh, this is Ayev Jawad Bashar, who once uh, was, uh, I think he, he found the, uh, the correct um, story. I, uh, he, who was saying that his father, who was, uh, I think it was his father, I'm, I'm not sure, but was an uh, immigrant from Morocco, I think, uh, uh, in the northern part in, of France, was uh, uh, a lot, uh, I don't know, uh, targeted by his neighbors for growing mint in his garden. I don't know why, but it seems that French people do not like when you grow mint in your garden. So <laughs> this, is, this seems to be a problem. And this was an expression of uh, his, uh, he being, you know, uh, a barbaric Moroccan who came to France and so on. Now the problem of Islamophobia is not that the people are growing mint or they're having uh, specific practices, I don't know, uh, <laughs> that, uh, um, yes, according to French are barbaric, is that they are everywhere. This is the problem, is that the, there are Muslims who are lawyers, there are Muslims who are workers, there are Muslims who are immigrants, so there are Muslims who are um, at the hospitals, uh, maybe they are healing you, and there are Muslims who are teaching you, and there are Muslims in every kind of, uh, um, every kind of society you can imagine in France. So this is the problem. I think this is why I'm very much attached to the idea that Islamophobia is way more comparable to the anti-Semitism, modern anti-Semitism in the, its modern forms, uh, the enemy amongst us, than the, uh, the colonial racism, such as the uh, racism towards Arabs. And also, maybe it's also very important to, um, to me, and uh, I'm very, uh, um, I think that the question that uh, uh, Dr. Salman Sayed raised is extremely important. I think that uh, when talking about Islamophobia and, uh, it's, for instance, the, its difference with the, uh, with, with the entire Arab racism is that there is something, uh, I think, which is a, um, the very common thing uh, of, of various Muslim communities across the, uh, the West and France and the West and the world is piety, is the idea of piety. Of, as my, uh, we say faith, but I prefer piety. Uh, um, uh, and I think that uh, uh, for answering the, uh, the question of Salman Said, and I'm sorry, because now I'm not speaking as a soldier, but I, just as someone who happens to be a Muslim living in France, but I think that uh, um, we should not only talk about Islamophobia, we should talk about Islam, of course, but we should also give our take on uh, I don't know, modern government, modern state. I, I'm saying this to Salman Said, I'm not teaching him anything. I know that he's uh, uh, already doing that. <laughs> but uh, uh, of course, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that uh, um, we should maybe take a little seriously the idea that, uh, I don't know, <laughs> and this, uh, this is what I'm trying to say, that maybe we should, uh, um, yes, uh, think about what we could, not uh, the, in the sense that, uh, no, positive thinking or something, not, not, not at all that, but uh, if we have to have um, a political speech, we should also be speaking about matters that are not just Islamophobia, but, uh, uh, that uh, are matters of the, uh, the whole Muslim community and the whole world. Uh, maybe this is also a way to uh, actually build um, an, an alternative speech from the, uh, a discourse uh, from nationalism that is uh, such, uh, um, I don't know, uh, such which is literally killing us right now. <laughs> We have a few minutes left if anyone else wants to just chime in, Ibrahim and Asif. Yeah, I just inserted two questions that were given to me because I know that like we don't have much time and Asif might want to add something. Um, so regarding like, you know, the fact that colonial tactics, counterinsurgency among other are used like, you know, uh, in uh, metropolitan, like, you know, uh, France or even within the US now, etc. cetera. Um, it, it's not like a new idea. Uh, it has been like, you know, over and over. 
the reasons are often like, you know, this is a way to like, you know, regulate post-colonial bodies uh, after uh, colonization or, or, um, officially ended. And these uh, post-colonial bodies are not living in uh, post-colonial, like, you know, geographic areas anymore, but they are living into the metro metropolitan area. So that's the, 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 the general idea, but I think, uh, th there might be um, something else in the sense that I do uh, personally think that without, you know, Muslim just being a, a scapegoat and being targeted to be able to like, you know, open up the door for targeting like over communities, etc. I think that what Guido Bors say in uh, the, the, the post face to the society of the spectacle is, is extremely important about terrorism. Uh, Muslims have become to embody, embody the figure of the terrorism, the, to embody like, you know, the terrorist per, per excellence. And I, I do think that that is used by states that are more, the modern state, the modern capital state, but is, uh, I feel at the same time that it's reinforcing itself, lose, uh, like a feeling that it's losing grasp also on part of the, 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 the population, on part of the game it has been playing for two centuries now or more, um, is also using that to survive and reinvent itself and justify like uh, the, the crackdown that it's imposing on uh, its population uh, at large. That doesn't mean that it doesn't attack like, you know, a Muslim for their Muslimness and Islam for the fact that it's Islam. And that goes to what Hamza more eloquently like explained like, you know, uh, a few seconds ago and the potential for Islam to like, you know, create an alternative uh, discourse. Uh, but it's saying that that's also maybe part of the answer. Um, the other question uh, was about like, you know, how to react to uh, people like Akim al Karawi, uh, basically, uh, native informants. I mean, there is no, um, how to say that, um, secret, like, you know, technique to, you know, fight them. But uh, I, I'll say, like, they're not, like, these um, uh, people who are, like, you know, profiting from uh, their um, supposed, like, Islamity or real Islamity to uh, access power uh, and access like, you know, richness, um, don't have to be like, you know, thought in any different way that uh, is uh, Islamophobes in general are thought. And many ideas were proposed in these panels and many ideas have been like, you know, proposed before. I think that's just the, 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 the same way they fought against. Uh, they should like, you know, uh, Islamophobes are fought against in general. We should fall, uh, fight against like, you know, nature informants without, uh, uh, losing um, uh, the, 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 the fact that that has been like, you know, the way in which uh, this happens and uh, uh, this has to be fought has been theorized, of course, by Franz Fanon, but by a lot of other, like, you know, uh, uh, thinkers coming from the black communities and other communities uh, and face the same kind of issues. Uh, Malcolm, X, uh, Malcolm X also talked about it and many, uh, many others. Thank you. In the minute or two we have left, uh... Asif, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, no, nothing, nothing special, actually. Uh, I mean, they, they, they were the other two panelists were really brilliant, and they explain it in in such a way that I don't think there is much to to add. I mean, I I, I shared my idea of having the more uh, of researcher in international media to put pressure on the French government. I think that's just fundamental. And uh, you know how uh, French media got really also upset. And when they're upset, it's good. Uh, when they, uh, when uh, for example, 20 or 30 researchers write something, an opinion in international media. And they have to share it because in somehow there is 20 researcher on the other side of the Atlantic is saying like something and the build up pressure. And uh, look, we have Hamza, we have Ibrahim, we have you, Munir, and many, many others. And I think if just you three guys and uh, bring up some friends and, and make this uh, article with 30 researcher, I think you will, go, you will give quite a hard time to these uh, uh, French journalists who day and night think and breathe about uh, Muslim in France, apparently. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well. Um... It was great. Uh, we actually kept in time and we had lots of time to discuss and we'll continue. I just want to thank you all. It was, a, it was an amazing panel and the previous panel was incredible. So it's been a great start to this conference and we look, we look forward to tomorrow as well. I just want to also thank the participants and all the, all the great questions we've, uh, we have and, and these will continue uh, uh, tomorrow and of course beyond tomorrow. So I'm going to pass it back to uh, Dr. Hatham. Thanks, everyone. See you, Monique.
Thank you, Munir. Thank you, Ibrahim, Asif, and Hamza. Really, it was a pleasure listening to you and uh, having your take both on the specifics as well as the law, the counterinsurgency, and then looking at the whole concept of uh, locating Islamophobia in the French society. I do ha what I have to say is sometimes we might uh, look at Islamophobia and not distinguish or differentiate between manifestation of Islamophobia and Islamophobia per se. So I think there are many different ways to look at the manifestation uh, while also locating Islamophobia. We didn't delve into anything relative to the whole replacement theory that is uh, uh, pushed around. And again, Hamza is thinking that the Muslims are everywhere. So uh, this also uh, the whole idea that we are in essence uh, are replacing uh, uh, the white society. So there is this whole imaginary that the Muslims are, are part of this replacement narrative. And there's a lot of these videos that look at population and birth figures and birth rates and so on, uh, which uh, is making the rounds in the uh, Islamophobic uh, blogosphere, internet, clash of civilization, uh, the nature of the state. Uh, but also to think about the counterinsurgency and think of also how COINTELPRO in the US context was a form of counterinsurgency that for all intensive purposes was very successful because it decimated the black uh, 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 revolutionary movement as well as the black resistance movement. If you think about all the major figures during the 1960s either assassinated, imprisoned, or had to flee into exile. Uh, just think about uh, the Black Panther Party and where they ended up. So we could actually make that comparisons relative to the COINTELPRO as a form of uh, counterinsurgency. And the last comment is also to think about the transnational nature of the war on terrorism. Uh, and it's not surprising that this past week, uh, Macron was hugging, welcoming, and uh, giving a vestiture to a Sisi in Egypt. Uh, I was trying to look at where are these Republican values uh, relative to uh, giving the highest uh, award or civilian vestiture to a Sisi, who's connected to the whole global economy of militarism, military industrial complex, and the weapon sales uh, through this whole war on terrorism. You need a fear in order to justify the constant military industrial complex that uh, if you look at the main states that are in the business of selling death machines, uh, the United States has 55% of the market. And then you speak out of France, the UK, Russia, and so on. And all of them are vested in creating uh, or forming uh, this discourse on a transnational level. And this is, again, a utilitarian function aspect of Islamophobia that could feed into the manifestations of it. So really, it's a pleasure to have you uh, in this discussion and look forward to tomorrow. So make sure to be with us at nine o'clock. We have a panel uh, that has uh, uh, really four great papers uh, that will be for us tomorrow. So we look forward to having everyone uh, join us again at 9 a.m. Uh, California time, 6 p.m., uh, Paris time, 5 p.m., UK time. And I can't keep up with the rest of the time zones, but uh, this is really part of the technology that makes us able to connect. So I say, Assalamu Alaikum, good to have you, and we'll see you tomorrow.